coffee and cream on Hail Varsity Radio with Andrew Rogers and Damon Benning. 1-1 pitch, a fly ball left field deep. This will send Pollock back at the track at the wall. Jumps up and that's gone. Alex Kirilov goes opposite field, a two-run homer to left. And with one swing of the bat, the Twins are back in front. It is 4-3 in Seattle. They're giving Newpar second base. But I don't know if he will take it. He's not going, and the pitch is hammered to left field! This could be! And it's gone! Nolan Arenado, a walk-off big fly! A three-run shot into the bleachers, and the Cardinals walk it off here at Bush Stadium. Deep drive to left. If it's fair, it's going to leave the yard. Home run! Seiya Suzuki with a line drive right down the line and left. It left the park in a major hurry, and the Cubs trail by one. It's now three to two. Well, as the right-hander sets, fires, and this ball's hammered to center field deep. Heading back, hits to the track, to the wall. It's gone. A three-run home run. Jason Hayward and the Dodgers strike first tonight. It's three nothers. Good morning, everybody out there. Coffee and cream in the morning on Hale Varsity Radio, powered by Currency. Ravi Lula in for Damon Benning this week. Andrew Rogers, happy to have you with us. Live from the H&H Chevrolet stage at Hale Varsity Club, 590 ESPN Radio in Omaha. The phone line, 888-638-4876. We're live on YouTube, live on Twitter. The Hale Varsity Radio and heard at sports YouTube pages. You can interact there in the comment section. We'll see it. We'll talk about it. Good morning, Robbie. Good morning, sir. How are you? Hey, I'm good. I'm good. I'm feeling okay after uh, the Kobe Bryant episode yesterday of the last dance hit me Oof. a little different. Yeah, hit you in the feels. Well, you know, it's it's one of those things. Every time I hear Kobe, see Kobe, talk about Kobe, it mm-hmm. reminds me. He's one of the only people, and it's weird, that I could tell you what I was doing, where I was, and how I reacted to his death and yeah like i could just tell you that the time the place everything yeah. i can tell you what i was eating yeah i was at usd mm-hmm. university of south dakota covering a volleyball match mm-hmm. with two of the other sports reporters in town uh back in sioux city i was eating pasta mm-hmm. and i get an update on my phone that says tmz yeah that was the first group to report it yep tmz helicopter crash Kobe and Gianna die. Yeah. And I looked up from my phone to my two guys and I go, Kobe just died. And they go, what? Nobody thought it was serious. Right. Yeah. And I said, no guys, Kobe just died. Yeah. And so now every time I, I see him, I think about just the story I had to report on him. I had to go back to the news station. We led with it that day. I think Elizabeth Warren was in town, and I said, no, we're leading. With <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, we're leading. He, he's yeah. a more iconic figure than Elizabeth Warren. And we uh, led with Kobe that show, and it was very somber, and I wore purple and gold. Like I, I can tell you everything yeah. about that day. Yeah, so I was actually on the air when it happened. Um, I was doing pregame for Creighton and Butler. It was a Sunday, and I believe it was Creighton's pink out game that year. And so I'm doing pregame for it on the radio, and this, this, uh, the old sports director back at at the old station, who works there part time just because he can't leave radio. <laughs> he like has retired four times. <laughs> uh, shout out to Neil Nelkin. He's a legend in the industry, um, at least here in Omaha, and. He comes in and shows me his phone. I'm on the air while this is happening. Like I'm actively talking about about Creighton Creighton and Butler. Butler. And he shows me his phone and it says TMZ reporting that Kobe Bryant has died in in a helicopter accident. And he's like whispering to me, have you seen this? And I shake my head, no. And so I hit my mute button real quick and I go, is this real? Because it's like, you know, TMZ. It's TMZ, and like, frankly, on stuff like this, they usually get it right, but there's a thing in my head that's like, hey, it's TMZ. 
And also, there was a part of me that didn't want to believe it. Right. It, it, it's that... I it's was that hoping... In your brain... Yes. I, I'm Kobe's not dead. I, There's no way Kobe's dead. And I, I was a huge Kobe Bryant fan. One of my first jerseys I ever got was a purple Lakers Kobe Bryant jersey. Eight or 24. Eight. It was the second one. It was the second jersey I ever got. The first one was a 1996 Scotty Pippen USA jersey. Um... And then the second one I ever got was this Kobe Bryant jersey. I got it for, I believe I got it for Christmas one year. And this was like 97, 98. So this was young Kobe. I was on board early. And so Kobe Bryant was a huge like figure for me growing up. And it's the reason I rooted for, he's the reason I rooted for the Lakers until Steph Curry came into the league, basically. And so I'm on the air and just trying to A, keep it together. it together. Because I'll, I'll admit, I, I cried when Co- when he died. Like after, as soon as I got off the air, I just sat in my car and cried because he was so important to me, and it was like a shocking thing. And, and he so was very, very great in the community after his basketball career. Yeah, and he he did. Um, honestly, it was kind of the way that he approached his craft, if you will, and kind of the his mindset which was very Jordan-esque. He talks about it in, in episode five of Last Dance, how everything you got from me, I got from him, right? I think that's a line that and he the, says the almost The reason we're talking about Kobe is because that he starred in episode yeah, five. Yeah, episode of five Dance, of The Last Dance. And I am reacting yes. to watching The Last Dance this week, as everybody knows. For the first time. <laughs> um, hey, people don't need to know that. And so, <laughs> and so as, as this is going on, um, I'm reminded of kind of the way he approached things. And the thing that really struck me about Kobe Bryant was the way that he, like the audacity of believing he could be Michael Jordan. Because that's essentially what he was doing. He's like, I can replicate that. He saw the greatest basketball player of all time who countless people tried to replicate. Like the entire NBA in the mid 90s to the like mid 2000s was trying to find, whether it was Vince Carter, Tracy McGrady, whoever, trying to replicate that single score type offense that could dominate Mm -hmm. the league. And nobody else could do it, right? And Kobe comes along and says, yeah, I can do that. And to be fair, he didn't quite get there. He was never quite as good as Jordan. But But the fact that he dared to put that out there and say, hey, this is the goal. The goal is not to be a great basketball player. The goal is not even to be an all-time basketball player. The goal is to be the greatest basketball player of all time, and I'm going to do it the exact same way that he did it. He got like 90% of the way there, (laughs) and and that's an incredible accomplishment. One of the best scorers in NBA history. To get to 90% of Michael Jordan is closer than anyone else has ever gotten, basically, and Obviously, like LeBron's got a different game and stuff like that. But Kobe just took the blueprint and was like, I can do this. And so that was always a kind of... I always found that kind of inspirational, honestly. Because the idea of... Sometimes the idea of reaching for things is kind of scary. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're overreaching to something like that. Because let's be clear. Deciding that you can be Michael Jordan, I don't care what your physical gifts are, (laughs) is nuts. (laughs) It's just out of your, you have to be out of your mind. And he came pretty damn close. Like he he almost did it. And because he had the courage to try and to say it out loud and to go for it the way he did, he became a top 10 basketball player of all time, somewhere in that neighborhood, depending on, you know, where you put him. And, And so that. I don't think I realized it in the moment, but that was a lot of what I was experiencing was this kind of inspirational figure to me was just gone. And he was the first athlete that I cared about a lot that died prematurely, you know, or, or even mm-hmm. celebrity figure, you know, um, like I love the dark Knight and I loved Heath Ledger, but I didn't have like an emotional attachment to him. You know, a lot of these celebrities that die young, I, I didn't have like a personal, not that I ever met Kobe or anything, but you know what I mean? I didn't have a personal attachment to him. 
And so he was kind of the first one that was like, oh, we were supposed to have more time with him. And that really that really hit me in, in kind of a, a dramatic way. And so, yeah, rewatching the, the episode five of The Last Dance is, I don't want to say it's emotional anymore, but it hits you different. Mm-hmm. You know, it's been a few years, obviously, since he passed, but it hits you really different. When I first watched it, it was only about six months after he had passed, and it was it was pretty emotional. It brought back a lot of things for me. I don't know if I've cried to a celebrity dying. Yeah. Like, you, that was the first time and only a, time at this point. There's a, a trend that has been going around on TikTok and other social media platforms where kids will start recording and then tell their parents that their favorite actress or mm-hmm. singer has passed away. Yeah, that's pretty, messed, out that's pretty and, messed up. Um, I don't know if I have an attachment like that to anyone. I'm, I'm trying to sit here and think like, all right, Andrew, if you could pick one person that you were just overly attached to, like, who would that be? And I didn't think I did, to be clear. I didn't. Right. Because it, I always kind of thought it was a little silly when people would react that way when celebrities died. And, like, I remember specifically when Robin Williams died. I know a lot of people really cared about him. And there were some people in my life that I knew that were, like, actively grieving him. And I was like, I, listen, he was great. But I, it was a, it felt a little silly to me. Mm-hmm. And then the Kobe thing happened. And I was like, oh, I get it. Yeah, I don't know if there's like a, a well, we're in a, player, if there's a blues player. We're in a different time period now when it comes to celebrities and that sort of thing compared to the way it was in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever. Because, I mean, you gravitated. I think more people back then gravitated more towards them than they do now because they're they're in so many roles and you actively, I think, I think at that time period, like in the mm-hmm. 80s and the 90s, you actively, if there was a Robin Williams movie that came out, you went to see it just because it was a Robin Williams movie. I think too. So, and I don't think, back. I don't think that that happens nowadays when it comes to actors and actresses, you know, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think most people go to see a movie just because somebody's in it. But I, think, I, I also kind of wonder, though, if we feel closer to celebrities because of social media. Like, it feels like we know maybe, them more, you know? Maybe, um, you know, maybe there's a few, like, ex-Cardinal players, but I think the reason Kobe hit a lot of people differently was because he was one of the best to ever play the game. Yeah. And he was so young. And, it, you know, he was so iconic that people would go around with with balls of paper. When you throw it into the trash can, you say Kobe. Yeah, you, you, don't, you don't say... Kobe. Like it, you don't. I don't, even I, don't see, say, I don't say Yachty or Molina whenever I like throw something from here to the wall. Or I mean, I, you don't you know, even Albert say Pujols if I hit a home run. You don't even say Jordan. You don't. Right. Yeah, like you don't. It's it's Kobe, mm-hmm. right? When you're tossing stuff in the trash, it's he has a iconic place in the culture, and so especially if you were kind of growing up in, I think a lot of people my age, and you see this in the NBA, right? A lot of the guys that are stars now, Kobe was their Jordan, right? He was that he was the Jordan for the next generation. You hear the reverence that a lot of those guys talk about Kobe with. He was their inspiration the way Jordan was his. And so we're kind of getting to the end of that era where whether it's like the LeBrons, the Paul Georges, the like Devin Bookers of the world. I know Devin Booker is younger, but those guys looked up to Kobe the way everybody mm-hmm. else looked up to Jordan. And so he had this huge cultural impact um, in terms of, of the basketball world and everything like that. And yeah, it was just, I was really, frankly, I was taken aback by my own reaction to it. I was not prepared to react that way. Well, no one was prepared to, well, to he get the line. news, right? Yeah. But I never thought there was a celebrity that I would react that way to. And mm-hmm. The fact that it was Kobe kind of took me off guard. Like if Jordan died and I cried, I would probably get it because I was like, I'm a huge Jordan guy. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, knock on wood, like if, if Steph died, <laughs> I right. would be devastated. I mean, he, he could be a close second, though, to Kobe in regards to Curry. Yeah, like, right. People are saying that now. Yeah. And, and he's I probably care about Steph more than I did about Kobe or Jordan, to be honest. Um but there's not there's not a lot. There's a handful of like I kind of thought like when David Ortiz got shot in the Dominican mm-hmm. Republic a few years ago, if it was going to be anybody, I, I thought it would be like him or Pedro. I was because those were like my guys on those Red Sox teams. And when he got shot, I was like, oh, that that's really that's a that's really too bad because it seemed like he was going to die for a minute there. 
and but I didn't react like this. It was crazy. And maybe it's because it was a near miss. I don't know. Well, you know, to further go with that episode, we were kind of joking coming in today because episode four or it's episode five and six, excuse me, they're connected in a way uh, financially mm-hmm. than more people think. So episode five was a lot about the shoe deal with Jordan and mm-hmm. how much money he gets in and, and Nike's risk to take on giving him what like passive income and result of the revenue that yeah. came in from the shoes. Yeah. And so they, they foregoed a ton of money by doing that, but also got a ton of money in return and still do today. So I think the goal was like $3 million in the first year. They sold $162 million worth of shoes. Yeah. Jordan rakes in roughly $400 million a year off of just his uh, built up interest in Nike or, or his well, stock. In uh, Nike. And it's the, it's the sale still. Cause he still gets mm-hmm. a, he gets a percentage. I can't imagine what the sales were like after the last dance. Oh um, yeah. But then it goes into episode six in the 93 championship when they went down 2 0. Jordan goes to he goes to the casino with his dad to blow off some steam and uh, comes back. The media is all over him, like, oh, he's not totally invested into, into this finals run. All of a sudden, now it's like, hey, he's got a gambling problem, which I, I truly believe he does. It could go down as competitiveness, like he says. He's competitive. He just likes to win. He likes to do that stuff. And that's true, too. But a lot of competitiveness is betting on either yourself in the moment, whether there's actual money put down, or it's actually betting money. So I'm like, just call it what it is, man. Like, just say you like to bet, and and that's that. Just move forward with it. And the media, stop exhausting a storyline that – You know, you're trying to grab onto any and everything Jordan in this moment. I get it. Yeah. But all in all, I think it's funny because we talked and said, this guy could lose a million dollars a year. A day. A day. I'm sorry. A million dollars a day and still be in the green just because of his Nike deal. Yes. And that's not talking about any other deal. That's not talking (laughs) about the value of the franchise he owns. Nothing else. If he lost a million dollars a day gambling and he would still be plus 35 million, right? <laughs> and so, which is still an insane amount of money, right? And so the the gambling thing is interesting because I think it I think it there's two things that I think are interesting here. Number one, I think it depends on how you define problem gambling because most people define it as mm-hmm. you sacrifice money that you need for other things. And notice how I didn't say problem. Right. I said addiction. Yes, I think he's addicted to I do think he's addicted to competition more than gambling, but but those the, go hand in the, hand. At this point in his life, that's the only place he can find competition mm-hmm. that he cares about is through gambling. So it's a it's kind of a fine distinction. Same there. thing with golf, though, on the court. Right, like he yeah. goes out there and he's just betting money away. And but the reason um, I think he, it, he was throwing quarters in the episode and betting with security guards. So that's why I think it's about competition and not about gambling. Because it doesn't matter the amount of money. But that's because he doesn't have to worry about the amount of money. Maybe, but like, I, he, he's uh, cool with throwing twenty dollars down and losing it just like that. If I threw twenty dollars down, I'm like, dang it! But remember the story that Will Purdue talks about when they're on the plane and he comes up and plays blackjack with them for a dollar a hand. Mm-hmm. It's I genuinely think the money is totally inconsequential to him. That's and, what I, that's what it is. But I don't think it's about how much he already makes. I think it's because. He just wants to win, and the money is a sign of winning. I think we're talking hand in hand here, Robbie. <laughs> I think we're talking about the same thing. Maybe <laughs> money is nothing to Jordan. It is. It is about. It is about com- being competitive, yeah. right? But it also plays into an addiction for uh, his vice is gambling. Everybody has a vice, yeah, right. Like during that title run, down two zero, the only reason everyone knew about Michael Jordan and gambling is because he was the best player in the world, right? And everybody was attracted to him. What was Scottie Pippen? What was Dennis Rodman? What was Steve Kerr doing during the, during this time? What if Steve Kerr's thing was going to a library thirty minutes out of town and just <laughs> reading a book? Like, would you say anything about that? Like, well, he drove away from the goblin. Like, he's not right. with his team. Like. No, you're not doing anything. Well, it's because like it's an acceptable, right, right. right. But, but I, so, but who, who right. puts that standard as acceptable? Well, society, right. You know, it's a, it's just a thing that we decided we're okay with 
reading. Is that right, though? No, I'm not saying it's right or that's okay, but it's as a society kind of what we've deemed to be okay. Um, if he wants to gamble, let him go gamble. Yeah. Off steam. Well, and so he I was think, with his dad. I think the other thing that fuels into this, and, and you, you mentioned, you kind of hinted at it, is up until that point, Michael Jordan's public image was essentially perfect. It was largely unblemished. Mm -hmm. And so at a certain point, we get a little sick of it, right? Like it, as a society, I'm not saying you and me personally, as a society, we kind of get sick of the perfection. We're like, oh, nobody can be that good. Sometimes the our, our worst natures think, well, he can't be that much better than me. Does he think he's better than me? We kind of like start feeding into a kind of a negative thought cycle. And I think that has a large part of what this was. It Because, listen, Charles Barkley gambled just as much as Michael Jordan did. But Charles Barkley is a largely flawed figure. And so we're like, oh, of course Charles Barkley gambles, mm. right? It didn't matter because we expected that from Charles Barkley because he's dating Madonna and he's throwing guys through windows. Like, that's who Charles Barkley was. That's not who Michael Jordan was. He wasn't the guy with a vice. He wasn't the guy with a quote unquote dark side because he went to legally gamble in right. Atlantic City. Right. And so I think a lot of it is we don't like the pretty image after a certain point. Well, in a weird way, credit to the media for fueling his fire inside of him. Absolutely. Of saying, I'll show you. Yeah. He comes out and, and drops 54 <laughs> the next I'll game. I'll show you. I mean, the, I don't think the media did the Knicks any favors there. Definitely because <laughs> like the last thing that dude needs is a fire lit under him and you just had like a blowtorch. <laughs> and so he goes out and he eviscerates the Knicks and they end up obviously going to the finals. Yeah, but... how many did they win in a row? Oh yeah. Four. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah, maybe don't make the guy mad who is notoriously spiteful. Mm -hmm. I mean And when he is feeling competitive. He'll win. Oh, he He'll gets win. He gets to another level. It I'm is, only bringing one suit to Phoenix, <laughs> right? It is a wild attribute that this dude has that doesn't. He, when you say things like that, it most of the time I'm skeptical because it doesn't feel real. Where it's like, oh yeah, when this guy gets a fire lit under him, he's unstoppable. And it's like, no, he actually is. <laughs> like anytime he was properly motivated or angry about something that was Good the thing ball game for the bulls that was it it didn't matter who was in front of him that was the whole deal we'll talk to brian christopherson senior writer at husker 24 7 at eight o'clock he's the first guest on the docket matt foster filling in for andy kendy over at KETV as a regular this week at 8.30. We'll play two for you at 8.45. We'll talk to Louis Vacare, publisher and managing editor for the wildcatreport.com. Talk a little Northwest fo Northwestern football, upcoming season talk, and uh, the new pieces that came out yesterday within the program. And we'll also talk the Open Championship with Ryan Belangi, and we will give our picks later on in the show. Michigan Lance, stick around. We will get to you after the break. More CNC next. Rogers and Benning will be back in five minutes. and Benning will be back in four minutes.
Rodgers and Benning. We'll be back in three minutes. and Benning. We'll be back in two minutes. in one minute. We'll be back in 30 seconds. Coffee and Cream with Rogers and Benning on Hale Varsity Radio. Hey, welcome back. Coffee and Cream in the morning on Hale Varsity Radio, pow- powered by Currency. Ravi Lula, Andrew Rogers, happy to have you with us. Thankful to all of you that join us in the comments section or give us a call, 888-638-4876. Terrence on YouTube says, Andrew, what the heck were you even watching during COVID? <laughs> this was must see TV every week. Terrence, believe me, believe me when, when I say this, I have two things I'm going to say. One, you'll probably punch me in the face over. The other, you'd probably be like, yeah, you're just stubborn. But uh, I didn't want to be a part of everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> for some reason so, some bone in my body said don't do it yet i know it was pretty it was pretty careless of me to do that it was a little silly but, but i understand the yeah. two whenever i'm watching something already i try to finish that before i start something else mm. because i won't ever go back to it mm. and the show i was watching at the time was gray's anatomy Oof. <laughs> yeah that's a good that's a good reaction to well, that there was a lot of Sorry, I was going to say there was a lot of people at that time during COVID when when documentaries and stuff were coming out that that they were just getting turned on to that for the first time watching that sort of entertainment. So it was really kind of a new medium for for a lot of people yeah. out there, really. Well, I'll say this too: Grey's Anatomy is like twenty six seasons, and I didn't finish, so and, there's no excuse to and me not still watch, going. Not I think. For the last dance. Yeah. yeah. 
That was a I'm <laughs> gonna, no excuse. That was a miss on you. Well, and you know the other thing about documentaries, I was never like, oh, I have to watch this documentary, which I don't know why, because true stories are my favorite. Where like, you... if I'm watching a movie that's based on a true story, that's my favorite type of movie. So I don't know why I don't. Did you not get into the 30 for 30s? And I am into 30 for 30s. So like the NC State one was one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, there's one that I was watching briefly last week and I had to I had to stop to turn on the Cardinal game, but I need to go back and watch it. It's the one with Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire. Yep. Um, so I'll go back and finish that one up. I think I'm an hour into into that. But sometimes I just I just struggle to to really sit down and finish something. Yeah, my favorite ones were Pony Excess, the SMU one. Mm -hmm. I've always been fascinated by SMU. Um, good one. Ever since, I, I mean, since I got into college There's football, there's a really good uh, and found Arizona it. State betting scandal. Yeah, uh, documentary that was on Netflix. The it's part of a series. Um, the the U was a really good thirty for thirty. The one about Miami. Mm, um, yeah, that one was really good. But uh, Sasha chimed in and reminded us where the kobe thing came from with well reminded you maybe yes. informed me so it came <laughs> i was just a part of the societal trickle down effect yeah of, hey this probably started it and then so it just kind of went to my yeah group. it's from a dave Chappelle skit back in like oh three and so that's where the yell and kobe when you throw stuff in the trash came from to to my knowledge and i believe sasha's right there um but you were i believe pre-k when that came out so <laughs> So that maybe doesn't apply to you yeah. so much, but I did remember, I remember watching it. The Chappelle show was, I didn't watch it live, but I watched it when it came out on DVDs. And so it was a big part of like my college years. So it was a big deal. Well, speaking of Kobe, let's go to the phone and talk to Michigan Lance, Shane, pot him up. Lance, good morning. Welcome to the show. Hey, good morning, Robbie and Andrew. How y'all doing today, fellas? Hey, good, man. What's up, How are Lance? You? How you doing? I'm doing good, man. Bring a little context to the to this Kobe conversation. Um, I think, like, so, so when did you guys graduate high school? 2015, 2005. And, all right. So I was in high school when Kevin Garnett and Kobe Bryant was in high school. Mm, okay. so I was a freshman when KG was a senior. Uh, Kobe was a junior. And then I was sophomore, Kobe senior. So I watched those guys. We pretty much grew up together, mm -hmm. and yeah. If you if you didn't blow I, out your knee, you would have been better than them. I obviously not saying that I played with them, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not one of those guys. Hey, I'm not a revisionist history guy at all. But but watching them, I, I think it's the way we watch them, uh, because you don't really think about it as you're going through it, but until somebody passes away. So if if it was Kevin Garnett. Instead of Kobe, I think people would have had the same reaction because we actually saw those guys from high school mm. play in high school to be drafted because they were one of the first. They were the first two. You know what I mean? KG being the first and Kobe being the second to, to do that in, in the cable era, in the internet era. Like, we watch them daily, and we really don't realize it until somebody's gone, and that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not a Kobe – I didn't grow up a Kobe fan. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I'm not even – I'm not a Kobe fan. But I respect what he does. I respected his game. But I thought he was too much copycat. In the era I grew up in, we were about originality. Now, if you want to take the, the work ethic and all that, that's fine. But when you start, you know, trying to talk like somebody, walk like somebody, and chew gum like somebody, that was – that didn't – in my era, that wasn't – we didn't fly with that. You know, and so Kobe, but it still affected me because I was like, dang, oh, hold on a second, man. I knew this. I've been watching this guy half of my life and his life. You know what I mean? Since mm -hmm. he was it's weird. 17, 16, 17 years old. So I did have a feeling it did affect me in, in a way uh, because we saw them, you know, saw them so much. And, and when you talk about the, I believe that's what it more of, of what it was with Kobe. Like, you know, the Kobe shot, you know, that actually came from Dave Chappelle. Like there was a Dave Chappelle skit where he <laughs> said that and did that. It really had nothing to do with Kobe's game at that time, because at the time when he said it, Kobe's game was still uh, high flying. It wasn't like he lost his, his hops and was shooting more of the fadeaway. It was still more in his prime with his hops. Mm -hmm. So he ain't he he didn't really rely on that a lot. So 
I, you know, it really wasn't his game that got us doing that. It was that. And then from there, people started to, you know, hey, you know, emulate, oh, yeah, Kobe. But, I, I mean, obviously his game, I, I'm just kind of just giving context of the of the uh, the culture impact that he had because Jordan had a different impact than him. Mm-hmm. Uh, Allen Iverson had a different impact than him. You know what I mean? Like Kobe's impact was basketball only. Those guys transcended. It was back on the court, but also off the court as well. Lance, we appreciate the call, man. Thanks. Um, and there's hey, a, thanks, fellas. There's another thing into that too that mm-hmm. I think when he was talking about just, just the Kobe thing and, and the attachment there to the people, it's almost the same with Jordan, though, in the sense of w- when the campaign came out, like be like Mike, mm-hmm. right? Every kid wanted to be like Mike. Well, then you hear something, and it was it a Spike Lee commercial. To with with Michael Jordan. Um, I think that was a different one. Was that that different was the one? Nike okay. one. The Gatorade one was the be yeah. like Mike. Trying to connect yeah. the dots yeah. here. But then they were about know, the same time. But frame, looking though. at the Dave Chappelle skit too and, mm-hmm. and seeing what they did there, it it almost just it when you see something funny or, or you really like somebody and then everybody starts mm-hmm. talking about it, and now all of a sudden, even if you didn't expect it to take off like it did, people are like, I like Kobe Bryant now. Yeah. And so yeah. there's like just this thing it's of kind like, of you don't know why. Perpetuating. Right? Yeah. You don't know why, yeah. but you're just like, ah, I kind of like Kobe because this person likes Kobe and I look up to yeah. this person. Now, in, in a way, I, I know what he's saying about originality. About sure. uh, the, the where, thing where, where he started like off. talking like Jordan, that was uh-huh. a little weird. I was more right. talking about emulating his game. Well, and you know, it, it's okay. And and Lance would be the first person to say this too. It's okay to have role models. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to try absolutely. to emulate your game after other people, because that's what we're seeing yeah. a lot today too. Kobe was just kind of like the first to mm-hmm. like really start that trend. Oh yeah. Guys um, steal moves and stuff from each other all the time. Right. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's not even close. I, I mean, there's some that are like Curry is a different, ball yes. handler than anybody else but yes. that's also why you see kids at home trying to do dribble drills like yeah that's why like, curry is like who curry, he is right? right so um and kobe admitted it i mean he admits it in the documentary yeah. he says everything that you saw from me came from him mm-hmm. So, like, he's fully aware of it. Like, it's not like but he's also, acting. I don't, I don't fault him at all for using his resources. No, I mean, why not? Just like me, I ask questions that I don't know the answer to. If I'm not an expert in something, I'll try to ask man, you if to, Michael or, or Jordan else to answering to your call. Yeah. You take everything that Eagle man says. Call. <laughs> like, if that dude actually picks up the phone when you call, like, yeah, you take everything you can from that man. Mm-hmm. That's, I get it. Uh, the, I, I, I do agree with Grant, with Lance a little bit where some of the mannerisms and stuff got that part of it was a little bit strange, but you know he's. He he brought up a good point. He grew up in front of our eyes. He was probably trying to find himself a little bit too. Mm-hmm. I mean, he came into, I believe he was 17 when he was drafted. He couldn't even legally sign his own contract. I think he had to have a parent or guardian there. And so, which is wild. Wouldn't that be right? awesome? And, like, and so, I always, I always talk about that. Like, can you believe that Jason Tatum is my age? Like, yeah, <laughs> no, it's crazy. You just start making those cuts the- a lot. By the way, one other thing that Jordan had that was really cool that nobody was really doing at that time. I mean, he was releasing video. I mean, he had the the, the VHS videos, like the hour long documentaries that he had, like Flight or whatever it was. Oh called. yeah, yeah. That that oh, like stuff Space was, Jam. No, not That's Space a Jam. Yeah, <laughs> that's based on a true story, right? <laughs> Absolutely. That's yeah. funny. Hundred percent fact. <laughs> you can just go into a different dimension anytime. <laughs> uh, we'll take a short break when we come back. I want to bring up SEC Media Days a little bit, maybe um, the Pac-12 TV deal that is supposed to be here but still isn't. That's next. Rodgers and Benning will be back in four minutes.
Rodgers and Benning. We'll be back in three minutes. and Benning. We'll be back in two minutes. and Benning. We'll be back in one minute. Rogers and Betting will be back in 30 seconds. Coffee and Cream with Rogers and Benning on Hale Varsity Radio. Hey, welcome back. Coffee and Cream in the morning on Hale Varsity Radio, powered by Currency. Robbie Lula, Andrew Rogers, happy to have you with us. Let's take a moment and tell you about Zipline's newest beer, the Can Opener Ale. Shane, do you remember what's in the Can Opener Ale? uh hops it isn't <laughs> beer maybe <laughs> <laughs> what 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 else do you think what what, is, uh, what does it taste like shane is there flour in it that like what kind of flour like, like yeast tulips? i think you're yeast. talking about yeast there is there yeast in it <laughs> yeast i, I think you mean guava yeast. there's some guava there is some guava and lemon in their new summer crusher the can opener can opener tropical ale perfect for that hot summer day refreshing and slightly tart, you can get it from your favorite beer store, and it's now available at all Zipline locations. I actually picked up a six-pack of that yesterday when I stopped by a big distributor out by the – is it the Oak Grove Mall? Oakview. Is that the – Oakview. Oakview. See, yeah. I'm trying. I'm it's, trying. Uh, I, I got 50% of the way. The beer, wine, and spirits yes, store? Yes, yeah. that's it. So that's in, a, uh, that's in an old Toys R Us building. Yeah, and it's sweet. And so I always just call it the Booz R Us store. Oh. Which I think they missed a, a little naming. Ravi twist. I think they missed a naming opportunity there. Yeah, probably. Um, but maybe they ran into some. Now it's like Toy. You know. Well, I think Toys R Us is out of business. So what are they going to do? Well, they, they probably still own <laughs> like the name for like 10 years, right? Isn't that how it works? Do, they own, own it for... do they own the R Us, though? I think uh, maybe if you did it like like the logo, yeah. Maybe if, if, if you if you did chicken scratch, I doubt it. But. <laughs> I think it's still an online thing. Like they have an online. Oh, store. Toys R Us does. I think so. Oh, there okay. you go. Interesting. There you go. Uh, also, something that I was I don't know if you're big into media day coverage outside of the Big Ten. Do you watch 
like did you watch the Big Twelve or the SEC media days or anything like that, or just like no, I kind of scroll. I kind of scroll and, through headlines and stuff like that, but um, I'm not as locked in unless something squirrely happens. Right. So something I, I talked about a little bit last year with Kirby Smart mm-hmm. well, in the schedule talk and the doubters, you know, people were saying that Georgia wasn't going to be as good. And he remembered that. Yeah, and so nobody said team. that. Nobody and, said that Kirby. Well, some people probably did, but I can't imagine like that was, that was your all out Michael Jordan moment of, Hey, I'm going to turn this into competitiveness and not my addiction for gambling. Not to say Kirby Smart has an addiction to gambling or anything. He fairly has um, an addiction of, uh, to whining, but though. he is definitely hot and bothered by schedule talk because he, for the second straight year, people are people are asking him about the schedule, and you had to predict this was coming, Kirby. Right? Yeah. When you get in front of other faces outside of Georgia media members, you had to predict that hey, somebody's going to ask me about this schedule because it doesn't seem like it's that tough. So he responds with three words: "Come play it. You come play this schedule, and you tell me." that playing in the SEC isn't difficult. But then he goes on to say, better never rests. Well, if you're being better, wouldn't you want to, like, you know, play a better schedule, play a better schedule, yeah. things like that. But that's not really what, where I want to land with this. Kirby, here's my thing for you. If you are the best team in football and have been the best team in college football the last two years, be prepared to take on criticism on every and anything. That's what the media does. They find one thing about your team, and they're going to continually ask you about it. Yeah. What did we talk about in the whole first hour? That's what we were talking about with, with Michael, Michael Jordan. Jordan. Yeah. The media finds one thing because they're the, he's the best at it, and they're just going to lock in on that one thing. You just have to know that. Yeah. You don't need to get defensive or anything like that. Just, just say, look. The schedule just didn't pan out the way that, you know, we, we thought it would. With Was it they, they were supposed to play Oklahoma, right? And and now they aren't or something like that. Yeah, and something like that. Now and so they've got UT Martin, though, so that'll be a bummer. Yeah, that, that'll be a good one. That'll be a really good one. <laughs> no, you have to be able to expect those, those topics. Now, aside from Kirby Smart, the other head coach that um, probably hit a lot of college – college the college football nation like kobe hit just the the sports world was mike leach yeah uh passing away back in january and so that was a talk a talking point for mississippi state especially will rogers he was in the spotlight a lot yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, not just because he's one of the only returning quarterbacks in right. the sec that at least people can remember outside of Jaden daniels at lsu um, i'm trying to think who else is at the top there but uh he took on a lot of conversations about coach Leach. And Mm -hmm. then you have Zach Arnett who's taking over for Mississippi state, which I thought was um, cool to see how humbled and honored he was to be in that, in that position and um, taking, taking the next title of head coach after Mike Leach. But another big storyline is Hugh freeze in the sec. Mm Mm-hmm. Because he comes in off of Liberty and off of some allegations of his own. Um, I, are they allegations or was it proven? I think he admitted I it. I think they were proven. I think he admitted so it. So I yeah. should say after just baggage, he's coming in with some baggage of his own. Yep. And he embraces the challenge of rebuilding Auburn, which I think is what Harson didn't do. <laughs> I mean, Harson was just a bad hire. He was a bad right? fit. He was a bad hire. I like they, they, fumbled that the bag pretty hard on oh that did one. they fumble yeah did they did they have some they fumbles? fumbled the bag <laughs> oh is, is that a little tie into the football reference well there? you know it's uh i just listen hugh freeze as a football coach is a terrific hire for well him. and he fits into the sec yeah he that's fits where in, he found most of his success he fits into the culture he was one of the only guys that's had any level of success against saban um really really good football coach kind of slimy as a human being doesn't make you feel great about it but auburn doesn't, doesn't mean care. he can't change but auburn doesn't care about that either right like auburn is okay with that well and that's the price they're willing to pay and i think uh, a lot of teams take a similar approach sure. like a lot of there are schools out there that put tradition first i'd say nebraska is one of them when all the urban meyer talks were going around like they knew that that was a 
a not non option, just, not just tradition, but like the the expectations kind of of their program, right? There is at Nebraska, and, and this is up for debate because if Urban Meyer came in here, won a national title, and then burned it to the ground like he has just basically everywhere else he's ever been, you there's a there's a portion of the fan base that would probably have been okay with that because they got the national. Well, they won. Yeah. Cause they got, because football's about winning ultimately, but there's a fan's perspective. There's a lot of the Nebraska fan base that requires Nebraska to win with a certain level of character, a certain level of class Mm -hmm. and a national title. If it came with dirty hands, I don't think, I don't think the entire fan base would be on board with that. And so, and the SEC is different for the most part. The SEC is mostly because of how competitive historically it is because of the situation between like Alabama and Auburn. If you're being outshined mm-hmm. by your in-state rival on a consistent basis, you probably are willing to sacrifice some things in order to catch up, right? And so that's where Auburn finds itself right. in a place where, they're willing to make some sacrifices. Well, and for me, I mean, it is really all about winning, ultimately what it comes down to. And and that's why when this everything kind of got started, it was I, I was on the Urban Meyer train of like, just hire the guy. He wins. He wins in college football. Now they found a better option in Matt Rule who wins in college football and is a character driven man. Mm-hmm. So they found, you know, best their, of both worlds, their, their royal yeah. flush up in up in Nebraska. But that that really is what it boils down to. So going back to Hugh Hugh Freeze in this instance, that's that's what you that's what you want. And sometimes you put aside, hey, do you do you actually like the guy as a person? If if it means uh, I'm I'm winning football games, more times than not, people would say no. As long as I'm winning, as long as as long as my football team has a W in 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 the stat line or or in the scoring chart, like that that's all I care about. So there's a there's a couple different philosophies when it comes to hiring coaches, and it's To me, there are certain schools that are okay dating a head coach with some red flags because they know they're going to have a good time, but knowing that at some point they're going to have to break up probably, right? Whereas there are certain programs that want to marry their head coach. They want them to be there for 20 years. They want them to retire there. They want it to be, you know, till death do us part, basically. And Auburn is a, we're willing to date the person with red flags. We're willing to, you know, go out with this person that we know we probably can't marry, probably can't bring home to mom, but we're going to have a really good time while we're dating them. Nebraska generally has has not been that way. They want they want the head coach that they can marry, that they can bring home to mom, that right away have the happily ever after till death do us part. Mm -hmm. There, it's listen. It has worked on both ends of the spectrum. Urban Meyer is a date the person with red flags head coach <laughs> matt rule is a go out and have some fun go to the bars every yeah. weekend and then matt rule is quite literally hey let's go to church on sunday with mom yeah and then let's go out for a big family dinner after church and you know Breakfast. go to the uh, yeah, wherever <laughs> unless you're going on lunch. saturday uh, family lunch is <laughs> we used to go to lunch after church every every sunday um but yeah and so they're just it's a different philosophy and nebraska historically has always been the we want the coach that is going to be there mm-hmm. for the long haul. They don't like, ironically, based on the last 20 years, they don't like the coaching turnover. They want somebody that can be there and be a steadying hand. Whereas SEC programs is like, hey, we're going to take this guy for as many wins as he can get us, and then we'll figure it out later. Mm-hmm. And listen, they're two different philosophies. Obviously, both have worked. Both have worked in college football throughout basically the history of college football. You understand when you hire certain people that... Yeah, you're probably going to have to fire him or part ways at some point. And the girlfriend that uh, you tell your family about that never shows up is like the Pac-12 dealing with this TV deal. Yes. <laughs> you just keep telling them, that hey, TV, I have somebody. Their TV. And she's special. <laughs> their TV deal goes to another school, but you've never met her. Imagine if they are a stream-only platform in 2024. How either – it could go one of two ways for them. It could be really good because everybody streams nowadays. Or it could be really bad because every other every other college football program is on cable. Yeah, well, they're going to lose a lot of money if they're stream over. <laughs> That's whether it works or not. They're going to lose a lot of money. We'll take a break. We'll talk to Brian Christofferson next. Rogers and Benning will be back in four minutes.
Rogers and Benning. We'll be back in three minutes. Here is Brian Christofferson. One more pitch, a fly goal, left field deep. This was sent probably back at the track at the wall. Jumps up and that's gone. Alex Kirilov goes opposite field, a two-run homer to left. With the one snow to back, the points are back in front. It is 4-3. Christofferson. One more pitch, a fly goal, left field deep. Back in front, it is 4-3 in Seattle. Rogers and Benning will be back in two minutes. and Benning. We'll be back in one minute. and betting will be back in 30 seconds. and cream with Rodgers and Benning on Hale Varsity Radio. Here is Husker 24-7 senior writer, Brian Christofferson. Yeah, it'll, it'll be a little bit of a circus act. Brian Christofferson. Well, I mean, that's that's pretty interesting. Brian Christofferson. <laughs> I, I kind of enjoy that. Here is Brian Christofferson. 1-1 one, one pitch, a fly ball left field deep. This will send Pollock back at the track at the wall. Jumps up and that's gone. Alex Kirilov goes opposite field, a two-run homer to left. And with one swing of the bat, the Twins are back in front. It is 4-3 in Seattle. All words Brian Christofferson likes to hear when his Minnesota Twins go up on the board. Back with you, Coffee and Cream in the morning on Hale Varsity Radio, powered by Currency. There's the man currently on StreamYard. If you're watching live on YouTube or Twitter, you can see Brian Christofferson there. Senior writer for Husker 24-7 and Husker 24-7 BC. Uh, I'll give anyone out there the chance to ask Brian anything. If you want to send a question into the chat room, we can grab it there, and I will send that question Brian's way. But let's welcome him in right now. BC, good morning. Good morning, guys. How you doing? Good. How are you? Oh, not too shabby. I didn't actually watch that game you played. Thanks for playing the Twins highlights. I do appreciate the uh, gesture. <laughs> Yeah, Shane, uh, but, that's all Shane over there. Yeah, Shane's a good good man. But uh, yeah. I was uh, watching the quarterback thing on Netflix, so I actually didn't see the game, the baseball game. Wow. How are you liking the doc? Uh, I got I got about five episodes in. I just kind of rolled through it. 
uh, Kirk was Kirk Cousins. For those who haven't seen it, he's kind of, I think, steals the show a bit and wins your heart. I mean, even if you're not a Vikings fan. And so um, I've had my doubts about Captain Kirk, but you, you kind of root for him. He's like your kind of uh, dorky dad um, that you want to see succeed. He's got his a memory room. Um, built in his one house and it's got a spot just for the Lombardi trophy to go up. And I know Packers and bears fans and everybody else is laughing at that. Like, well, that's just going to be a blank space for his entire life. But it inspired me to hopefully to get uh, one of your own, to put a blank spot yeah, in get, for the trophy. Yeah. Well, to get a memory room, I guess. And then, uh, I, it, it got me fired up for the season and I hope the Vikings like rally around getting Kirk this trophy for his memory room. Well, he may have won the hearts of the people, but can he win in prime time? Yeah, you know, uh, th th that came up a few times. Um, th <laughs> th I'd make a point to that, which he makes as well. You know, when you're playing in prime time, the Vikings as a team naturally stink in prime time if you go, go uh, through their records over the years. And you're always playing a good squad, and, you know, so you're going to lose more. So, yeah, we'll, we'll try to get that, that uh, stat righted, though. Well, okay, let's start here, BC, because yesterday six former Huskers will be uh, were announced to be inducted into the Nebraska Football Hall of Fame in 2023, uh, all deserving of the honor, although it seemed like yesterday was the day to remember Taylor Martinez <laughs> after uh, he headlined the group. Uh, is there a favorite memory of yours or a favorite moment that you too would like to share that sticks with you whenever you hear the name Taylor Martinez? Um, there's a few. The the 2012 game actually in East Lansing when he was a junior. And um, that's like my favorite Taylor Martinez game. That's the one where Nebraska was down 10 in the fourth quarter. They rally. He scored on like a long 35 yard touchdown. Well, he had a long like 80 yard run in the first half, but then he had a 35 yard or something like that in the fourth quarter and then hits Jamal Turner in the final seconds for Jamal Turner's first Husker touchdown. But in between all that, it's just nutso stuff where like he throws a pick inside the five yard line. People might remember that Michigan State ran all the way back, but there was a penalty. So it didn't count uh, for a touchdown. Um, and then he had a play where it was the most my favorite, like, uh, I guess, encapsulation of Taylor Martinez, where he fumbles the ball. It looks like he might race off for like a 70 yard touchdown but he fumbles it. It looks like Michigan state might pick it up for a second, but like three Spartans miss, miss it. And uh, Taylor Martinez picks up his own fumble and just keeps running forward for about five extra yards. <laughs> um, that, that game had all sorts of weird stuff, but 2010, when he jumped on the scene, um, I was working at the newspaper and we had caught win. We had a decent connection with, with Polini, uh, and I'll give, a, I'll give my cohort at the time, sip a lot of credit. We were pretty well tied to Polini and we had kind of caught wind, um, that Taylor was going to be the guy that year as a red shirt freshman. And if you take yourself back to that place in time, most people didn't, wouldn't say that they wouldn't believe it. So I remember on shows like this, you'd go on and you'd say, well, I think you got to watch out for Taylor Martinez and people would be real skeptical of it because, Zach Lee was still in the room as a veteran, although he, I think, had arm problems at that point in his career. And Cody Green was there. And people were still kind of hoping Cody Green was going to take off at Nebraska. But then um, Bo kind of kept it a secret publicly up until, I think it was like when they announced him coming out for the first <laughs> series. And the crowd, it was just like this buzz, unlike any quarterback announcement I've ever heard in that stadium sort of a like anticipation, but also like who knows what the heck's going to happen. We don't really know anything about this guy. He, he had red shirted, but he honestly hadn't been written a lot about that first year. And, um, you know, the third play third and one from the Western Kentucky 46, he, he fakes it to, to Roy Hallou and he takes off. And it was, uh, just the, the way he had that burst and separated from everybody there was, it was one of those oh my moments that you don't get that often in the stadium, but that was one of them, like to really realize this guy's speed and that that was going to be a part of the equation. So that that memory comes to mind. I also remember he, you know, he wasn't the best, especially at first behind the mic. And so, you know, he said like he does good against road games or he had some quote that everyone kind of made fun of before they played at Washington. And I remember going up the elevator to the press box for the Nebraska Washington game that year. And 
the Washington folks were chuckling like, yeah, let's see. You've, you've played high school road games. Let's see how you handle this environment. And then Nebraska just goes down the field on their first two possessions like nobody's business. And Taylor had kind of his coming out party and then the K-State game a couple weeks later. So mm-hmm. 2010 was a, was one of the most fun years I had covering a team in part because of him. It was a It was a team that probably underachieved a little bit for what they could have done. And you always wonder what would have happened had he not sprained that ankle in the Missouri game. That was a good day for the Huskers, but sort of a bad deal long term with what happened with Taylor. And I think it affected the offense a little bit the the rest of the season. I love playing in away games. <laughs> yeah, there you go. BC, not to uh, just continue down Taylor Martinez memory lane here, but if I, I were chills throughout my body, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If I'm if I'm remembering right wasn't it even unclear that he was actually a quarterback when he got recruited? Cause he got recruited as yeah. an athlete. Right. And mm-hmm. it wasn't totally clear, at least through a portion of his, I think red shirt year here that he was actually going to play quarterback. So that was kind of part of this mystery yeah. around him too. It was a very strange situation that I can't really imagine playing out again. Like it, it just is so bizarre. Yeah. That's a good point. You bring up it. Th- for people who weren't following Husker football closely at that point or they're they're younger, it definitely was weird, like something you wouldn't see, I think, even now where you're right. I don't think people even necessarily knew for sure he was a quarterback or they thought of him as much in the race. I think by the summer, it was clear that he was definitely a guy you should, well, keep an eye on. But you, I don't know. Around here, we're sort of trained to think like, well, it's not his turn yet. You know, we kind of think of like when there's we could talk about position battles on this team and how we maybe have to retrain our mind, especially with this staff. Like, hey, I mean, there are freshman guys who are just going to knock some some veterans to the side. And you got to keep in mind that could happen. But at that time, I think because Zach, even though the 2009 year had been a struggle, Zach Lee was still around and uh, Cody Green. um you know, it never quite took off for him like people hoped it would. But you have to put yourself back in that year. And there wasn't enough data yet that that wasn't going to work yet. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of people that were, I mean, Cody was a great guy. First off, still is. And, you know, six, six, four to 20 QB at the time or whatever he was. It, it, he just like looked apart and you thought, oh, that's the guy. He was so good in front of the media. And all that stuff. And then you get this guy who's a little awkward, of course, in front of the cameras. And nope, so am I. But, uh, you know, <laughs> he he uh, he would say stuff that was quirky and, and all that, like those quotes you played. But when you watched him run that first year, people didn't know what to do with him. And I, you can't lose sight of the fact after that K-State game, um, the fifth game of the season that year, he was like the biggest thing in college football mm-hmm. right then. I mean, he really was nationally. He was like the buzz. I remember ESPN had a sports science show. Do you remember that where they yeah. would show you like, oh, like that was great. and they did the guy did one specifically on like Taylor Martinez after the K State game because he was that much like uh, in people's conversation around the country. Like, who is this dude? You know, um, so. Yeah, it obviously didn't kind of finish how you wanted in 2013 and the turf toe. And there's always questions about like what went wrong, you know, why he wasn't really part of that season as much. Uh, But he definitely deserves to be a representative uh, in the Nebraska Football Hall of Fame when you look at all his numbers. And um, I I actually tweeted I kind of made a mistake. I called it the Huskers Hall of Fame the other day. And it's there's there is a distinction there. It's the Nebraska Football Hall of Fame where they people have contributed to football in the state of Nebraska. So there's like state college guys and, mm. and things like that representing that. So people need to kind of be clear on that, but uh, it was cool to see him get in there. And Troy Dumas as well as a guy I just interviewed a couple weeks ago from the nineties that I was re- a good friend of the show. Yeah. I was just really pumped up for him um, because he gave his body for this program. He really did. If you hear the, his stories and like what kind of what it did to his body, it, it, it beat him up, but he, he was a guy who could hit like nobody's business. Ryan, we won. I, I wanted to, you mentioned a little bit there, the kind of the deservingness of, of Taylor Martinez. I'll be honest. It, it kind of, the idea of it didn't hit me quite right at first. The idea of, of Taylor Martinez as a Nebraska football hall of famer. And then you kind of think about it and you remember, I mean, obviously the stats are there, right? Because of how long he played and started and he was super productive. 
but it's kind of an odd period in Nebraska football where you kind of always expected more, especially after the way his career started here. I mean, more or less, after that Kansas State game, a lot of it felt like a disappointment, right? So I I think the, the way I was thinking about Taylor Martinez and kind of the actuality of what happened, especially considering the time since Taylor Martinez, I probably don't remember him as favorably as I should. Is that something you've experienced at all? Well, I think, I think you're, you're hitting the the truth of that era that there was so many different opinions about, I mean, first off, just the head coach, like that, you know, you could draw a line in the sand there. And so then every topic that separated from there, um, it feels like there were camps, right? You were over here, over there. Like you, you believed in Taylor was going to take him to the big place or you didn't. And um, it is disappointing a little bit in the sense that 2010 was honestly the team. I, we always talk about the 2009 big 12 title game mm-hmm. around here and the second, and I get it, but 2010, man, they blew they up, the up, yeah. up 17 points on OU. Taylor wasn't quite a hundred percent, but the game started so well. Mm-hmm. And if Nebraska wins that game, um, they would have played UConn, I believe in the Fiesta Bowl because the way that it was structured and the Big mm-hmm. East had to have someone and Nebraska would have been a top five team, probably in the polls, 12 and two, if they beat o- OU in that game. So that's how close that squad was. But then there was that train, the, the transition of the big 10, which I think was more difficult for Nebraska than we, we were imagining going in and you had to adjust to that. And Taylor was right on the ground floor having to do that. And, uh, we were still in that period also where, um, nine to 10 wins. I mean, right now that seems really good, but at the time it was just like, come on, get over the hump, get to, get to that 11 wins, you know, get into that, that big bowl game and, uh, be the top five, top 10 team consistently. So there was always something that I think for a good deal, the fan base was a, a little, um, it felt like something was always left on the table that could have been had and that, you know, But I do think as time goes on, people look back and be like, yeah, he was a pretty entertaining QB. And you can kind of go back at certain players and you you get five to 10 years to separate yourself from their careers. And uh, some of the high emotions that carried over from certain games or situations start to drift away a little bit. And you just remember um, some of the the magical plays and, of course, some some games that were tough, like uh, Texas A&M on the road when there was a <laughs> sideline incident in 2010 and all that. So it was definitely a career that always had headlines uh, attached to it that were interesting. All right, BC, the question coming through the chat room here for you, who will be the one player on defense? This is from Ken, who, will, who has a real nasty streak on the field, if any, a tone setter like Charles Haley, someone who could run C block. Hmm. Boy, that's good. Nasty guy. Um, I'll, I don't know if he's going to fit exactly what, what this question is about, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to use it to speak generally about hopes for the D-line and guys who could be difference makers there. And I'm really excited to see what Nash Hutmacher looks like now. Mm-hmm. Like, just I feel like there's enough – off-season buzz and he really took to the strength and conditioning program of of Corey Campbell and um you know I think the the label on him was he was a power guy of course who could lift anything but um can he be that guy who has that athleticism and can make plays you know east to west and do all that stuff and it sounds like there's a belief he can you know demonstrate more of that in his game this year and he has, he's been a guy so far who's been kind of what I'd call like a fringe type player. He's important, but he's that 15 to 20 snap a game guy previously. And I think you can see that double and stuff. And he's a, he's just one of those players where I, I think if he can take a couple steps, it changes the picture of how we look at the defense right away. Even if we don't know exactly what the scheme looks like when it's game time under Tony white and all that stuff. Uh, So he's a guy that, um, you know, does he have that Nash nasty like edge type that like he's talking about Charles Haley? I'm not I'm not sure who I would point the finger on that, but Huttmacher is that guy that I'm really excited about if uh, if he can start if it can really click for him because that that could be a game changer. Brian, let's flip it over to the other side of the ball with the offensive line. Our 
our good friend uh, Matt Verzal always talks about kind of the need for that same kind of nastiness and a little mm-hmm. bit of a streak on the offensive line. Do you think there's any indications that that's kind of being developed at all? Because, you know, I, I think there's a certain amount of ability on that line, but it, they're obviously missing something, whether that's schematically or in their mindset. Do you do you think there's a potential for that sort of attitude to develop on that side of the line? I think they got some guys who can flip that switch. I think uh, New Ely is a guy like that. Um, you know what? Just a great guy to talk to. But I think he's he he loves. Like, I still remember when he transferred from Colorado State in the interview. I had a lot of fun. He's one of those guys who he's like, I love football because. And I think people will take this the right way. The quote was basically like, it's a way to be violent with, you know, within the, and it's legal, you know, like to hit someone and just really enjoy that. And that's, I love hearing that whenever a guy in the trenches is coming up and talks like that. And uh, so I think he's got that in him. And uh, it it really hurt him as he shared with us in the spring when he met the media, how much, um, you know, it, it cost him and the squad to be out last season with the suspension. So I think he's got a lot of pent up stuff that that's going to come out in his play. Um, so he'd be somebody I point to, but it's an interesting dynamic with the O line because there's positive momentum because of all the stuff that's been said about Donovan Ryla uh, from Matt Rule um, and how the coaches believe in him. And then there's been some good recruiting, obviously there with the uh, Preston Tamua, you know, this last week uh, adding to that. So I think it, it has changed the narrative a bit, but I think where it's put the narrative right now is people are like, okay, I have an open mind now. Um, let's see what you got. It's not necessarily that people are just going to believe everything they hear in the fall camp about this old line, but they're going to be like, I'm going to give them a shot uh, because I, I do understand the points of, you know, last year would have been tough for any assistant coach with the offense they were running and all the turmoil in the program than to have a lot of success um, you know, and what you're doing. So I think there's, there is people who are saying, well, all right, let's, let's see what he's really about as a coach now. Cause last year probably wasn't the best example. BC, uh, we're talking to Brian Christofferson, senior writer at Husker 24 seven BC. What's the big difference about the hype this time around with rule versus frost when it comes to their first recruiting class? Hmm. Well, I mean, they got to it's got to be proven that this this class is a hit, too, because your question's a good one, Andrew, because we could say this every, you know, every time this year you can look at stuff on paper. Nebraska's always been pretty good on paper recruiting wise. Mm-hmm. It's just been like, can you really develop those players? And, um, you know, can you get the four stars to play like four stars? You could start there, you know, like a guy like Bryce Ben Hart's a guy who is a big time recruit and it's, it's sort of stayed in place. And now you're seeing like, let's see what a new staff can do with them. Maybe they do take him to another place. Um, so if you see some of those older guys start to pop a little bit where you're like, yeah, that guy looks a little different to me this season. And it's not the same old, same old. That would give you a lot of encouragement. I think about um, the younger players who maybe you don't even see as much. And also, um, I just think, I mean, you saw a a little bit of a taste of it even in the spring game. Frankly, Cam Lenhart and Prince Will, uh, even then, and I know it's I'm the first to say, don't make too much of that scrimmage, but those guys like look better than most true freshmen that walk around here that have come through this program already when you just saw them practice and stuff like that. And to see them out there with the ones and flashing the way they were, obviously they're going to have their growing pains. Um, but those guys were two examples from this class that are already right in front of your eyes. Who you're like, man, they look pretty good. I'll take my chances with them. So I think that adds to the optimism that there's really something there. And also the, the just the, the data points, I think, established through Rule and Evan Cooper working, you know, Evan Cooper just identifying guys, believing in the way they recruit and the way they look at traits and how that uh, has played out for him at Baylor and Temple. I think that past success is making people think, well, maybe there's a shot that it it can really happen here because they have a little bit more proof probably than the the last group did. Brian, I tend to agree with you that the the reasons for optimism are probably on the defensive side of the ball, especially I'm I'm excited about that defensive line kind of for the reason you talked about. If you wanted to find some optimism on the offensive side of the ball, are you looking at the offensive line kind of like you were talking about where they might be able to 
start performing like the recruits that they were? Or is there a place that you're looking at offensively that that you could maybe see uh, some light at the end of the tunnel there? Yeah, I, I would start with the old line and the belief that um, they can and probably will be better to some degree. Now, how far that goes, um, I just think the mindset from what we've heard, it might be a little bit more of an old school attack, you know, from this Nebraska offense. And I think people are going to have to have patience. I don't think it's going to be easy right away. Damon, I know, stresses this every week on the show. He really talks about the defense a lot and it, you know, that having to be portable, especially mm -hmm. early in the year while this offense kind of finds itself. And I sort of envision and I'm wrong a lot, so probably will be this time. But I think, you know, some of those early games, you know, people might have to settle in for some old fashioned Big Ten football where you have the type of offense where you let's say you start a drive on the 25, but you get a couple first downs, you take three or four minutes off the clock. Um, it's not just a 60 second possession where you give it right back and you're going to lose time of possession by 12 minutes by the end of the game. But you maybe get two first downs, you get to midfield and it, it stalls out, but you punt and you play that sort of Big Ten game, you know, where you, you rely on your defense to, to keep field position sort of tilted your way. I could see that being a formula early on in the season if this team's going to have success. Um, not that there won't be some nice drives too that they finish off, um, but I do think just kind of reading between the lines with this this offense and the way they've talked about it, I could see it being more Husker old school where it's like have a little patience in the first and second quarter. Some of those drives aren't going all the way and hope that you're kind of leaning on them. And by the fourth quarter, it has an effect like it it, it used to not 1995 style, but like, uh, <laughs> you know, where you, maybe 2010 style where that group sometimes had a way of finishing people off in the fourth quarter. So hopefully they can start to get back more to that. BC, we appreciate your time this morning. Thanks so much. We'll talk again next week. Yep. Thanks, guys. Happy Wednesday. That is yep. Brian Christofferson, senior writer at Husker 24-7. Coming up, Matt Foster, sports anchor at KETV. He's next. Rogers and Benning will be back in five minutes. and Benning will be back in four minutes. and Benning will be back in three minutes.
Rogers and Benning. We'll be back in two minutes. in one minute. and betting will be back in 30 seconds. With Rogers and Benning on Hale Varsity Radio. You know, we opened the show talking a little bit about Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant and how Kobe would pick the brain of MJ. And it was kind of like MJ was his big brother in this case. And uh, I think it's a good comp to talk about big brothers, big sisters at this moment, because their mission is to support one-to-one mentoring relationships that ignite the power and promise of youth. Bigs meet with their littles twice a month to do activities. They both enjoy in the community, like getting ice cream, playing a sport, whether that's, you know, attending it or, or actually physically playing like basketball outside, whatever, playing video games, you can take advantage of those opportunities and be a part of just a great organization. I mean, research has shown that positive relationships between littles and their bigs have a direct and measurable impact on the child's life. And now if you can't and and don't have time to sacrifice at the moment, you can Find other ways to be involved with the organization, Um, Big Brothers, Big Sisters of the Midlands. You can donate money, donate tickets to events for matches, invite them to uh, present to your business. You know, just a a lot of different things. If you want to be involved, go to MentorOmaha.org to sign up and become a big today. Let's go to the phone now and talk to Matt Foster, sports anchor at KETV, at Matt Foster TV on Twitter. Matt, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Hey, fellas, how are we doing today? Very good. Taking the place of AK. You got big shoes to yeah, fill. You we'll, think you're uh, up for the task? Sometimes pinch hitters come first, so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and you know what? When you need that big-time big, big time home run, and if you hit it out of the park, I'll make sure AK gets the message. Um, All right, sounds good. Now, you're a graduate of Wisconsin. You joined Correct. KETV, uh, the sports team, in the back end of 2019, if I'm correct. Yeah, uh, you've experienced the highs and lows of Nebraska football in your time watching. Well, Wisconsin win normally and covering the team. When you look at this season in particular, though, I want you to weigh your two loves, your school pride and your community pride here. Honestly, who do you think has done it a better overall job in year one leading up to their first season in the Big Ten as a head coach? Luke Fickle or Matt Rule? I think it's a little hard to compare in the sense that Rule has clearly had a full rebuild on his hands where Wisconsin's been in a better spot. You know, they did win a bowl game uh, last year, despite how rough of a season they had overall. Um, and I think they've each done well recruiting to their strengths. Um, Fickle wanted to come in and change Wisconsin's offense. So they go and bring in 
um, two transfer quarterbacks. We're going to assumably change that system a bit, yet to really get a chance to see that in person or um, anything. Rule, obviously, I think has done a good job of just kind of flipping the narrative within the program. Um, when you talk to a lot of the players nowadays, it's, it kind of seems like they've put that woe is me mentality in the past, like, oh, we, we're almost there. It's like they're kind of done with that because um, you can't have that mentality moving forward if you actually want to win these close games. You can't keep saying we're close, um, we're almost there. Um, you just have to do it. Mm. Matt, are you prepared to live in a world where Wisconsin is possibly running like an air raid system? Like that feels between Brian and Tanner Mordecai from SMU, where he put up a ton of big numbers, and Phil Longo, who's got the background in air raid systems, most recently at North Carolina and Ole Miss. Like, have you been able to wrap your head? Not that they're going to abandon the run, but have you been able to wrap your head around how differently this Wisconsin offense might look in the very near future? Probably not completely yet, um, because the closest thing Wisconsin has had to that in my lifetime was when Russell Wilson was there for a season. Sure, yeah. Um, and even then, that style of offense is not what they're, you know, planning on implementing um, under Longo and, and Fickle. Um, so, and they didn't really show much during, during spring camp. Um, they don't do like a full on spring game, like, um, Nebraska does or anything like that. So they didn't really show a ton. Um, so we won't really know what that's going to look like, um, come the fall. Um, but it's certainly going to benefit a guy like Braylon Allen, who last year with Graham Mertz's struggles, you know, you're seeing eight, nine man boxes Mm -hmm. on a consistent basis. Um, and it's, always been a credit to Wisconsin that they've been able to run the ball that well, just in spite of having, you know, quarterbacks with ducks for arms. <laughs> um, but yeah, Mordecai had a good, you know, track record at SMU, um, still prone to, to turn over the ball a little bit lock, you know, coming from Mississippi state, um, kind of see how we adjust to different style of, of defense that, you know, big 10, teams tend to play compared to sec um but that's just kind of the new era of college football it's either adapt or get left behind and you could kind of see the wheels turning at wisconsin that it's like they could no longer just do be one-dimensional on offense and want to continue um to progress and kind of stay competitive with some of the bigger programs in the country Matt, looking across the the landscape of the Big Ten, using what you know and how things played out last year, who do you think will make the biggest leap, and who do you predict will drop off in the Big Ten this season? So I'm going to say for biggest leap, I'm going to throw kind of a, an oddball team out there. I'm going to say Maryland. Really? Okay. Um, yeah. Um I, I'm always been a firm believer that quarterback play goes a long way. And talking about is entering his, I think maybe third season starting now. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems like he's been there forever. Yeah. As long as Graham um, Mertz is like at Wisconsin. in college for, yeah. <laughs> um, I just think they have a, a chance to kind of continue to improve. Like they were um, competitive with like Michigan last year um, for a couple of quarters. Um, I don't think it was the same. I can't remember if they played Ohio State or not. Um, but Michigan State could be another team that, you know, just happened to have a, a down year last year, trying to sort things out and having to replace Kenneth Walker um, was obviously no easy task. Um, and I think you saw that. Um, biggest drop off, if you can even say it, um, despite how bad they were last year, could be Northwestern. <laughs> so they, they, yeah. they lose that one I mean, game and go 0-12? <laughs> well, that's a very real possibility, and there's still the chance that they lose a bunch of guys to the transfer portal. Mm-hmm. Because they have a 30-day window following um, the Pat, Pat Fitzgerald stuff. So you don't even know what that roster is really going to look like when they open up camp on, on um, the first day. Um, so yeah, it's weird to say for a team that only won one game last year, and it's they yeah. even come on American soil um, <laughs> because I don't 
see Purdue really dropping off. Um, I think Walters was a pretty solid hire I think for them. So, too. Um, so I think they'll stay probably steady at least. And might. I don't think we'll see the kind of offensive flair um, that we saw from the Boilermakers under Brom. Um, I think Iowa obviously upgraded at quarterback. Mm-hmm. So we'll we'll see if Brian Ferentz can hit that uh, point threshold or not <laughs> uh, with McNamara. Um, and then, you know, I would expect Illinois to, you know, kind of continue to move forward. I think Bielema's done. And I hate to say this because Bielema was coach at Wisconsin, obviously. I think <laughs> he's done a good job at kind of getting that program back on its feet. Matt, I wanted to switch gears with you here real quick before we let you go. We've got a, a, about a, a minute and a half. Um, Creighton basketball, we got, we're got we getting little video clips and things like that from summer workouts and and things like that. Obviously, they they bring back a couple of huge guys in Trey Alexander and Ryan Kalkbrenner, who on social media we saw nail a three yesterday, so I was very excited about that. <laughs> um but as you kind of look at this roster and the way it's constructed and, you know, the guys coming back and the new guys coming in, what are you kind of thinking about as we are still a few months away, but I'm always thinking about college basketball. What are you thinking about might be some of the biggest differences we see between last year's team and this year's team? Well, I think first off is the schedule. Um, last year's schedule was so top heavy with, those big games early in Maui. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, Mac never really got a chance to get some of those younger guys minutes. And that obviously hurt them by the end of the season. They didn't have the bench depth. Um, you saw in that San Diego State game, which was so physical that the starters each played at least 35 plus, I think. Mm-hmm. And they were just, they were exhausted. Um, they didn't really have the legs down the stretch. Um, so getting those newer guys, um, minutes and kind of building that chemistry and that trust with that group and feeling comfortable to say, Hey, it's, you know, a four, five point game, but I'm comfortable having my second and third guy off the bench in the game. Whereas last year, I feel like they didn't really have that luxury. Um, another thing is that four spot is going to be so crucial to if Creighton lives up to the kind of expectations um, that they have for themselves mm-hmm. or if they fall a little short of those. Um, that's still going to be an ongoing battle um, between Trout, Jason Green, Mason Miller, um, and maybe they'll start to get a better sense of that after this Bahamas trip. Um, but it's another fun season on deck for sure. Matt, we appreciate your time this morning. Thanks so much. And let Kendi know anytime he's out that you're the guy filling the chair. We appreciate you. Sounds good, guys. Have a good one. That's Matt Foster, sports anchor at KETV. Awesome job. First time guest, long time listener. There we go. Love it. Long time listener. Well, I guess the last eight months. <laughs> <laughs> we will take a quick break. When we come back, we'll play two for you. Haven't played it in a while, but we will Let's do that. Go. Next. Give us a call, 888 638 4876, if you'd like to play. Two for you up next. Rogers and Benning will be back in four minutes. Rogers and Benning will be back in three minutes.
Rogers and Benning. We'll be back in two minutes. and Benning. We'll be back in one minute. Rogers and Betting will be back in 30 seconds. Coffee and Cream on Hale Varsity Radio with Andrew Rogers and David Betting. Now one of Damon's favorite games. And one of Shane's favorite games. Is this the game where I have to write stuff down? Well, maybe not so much Shane. Yes, Shane. This would be the game. Yes, it's two for you. All right, let's do it. Wow. Maybe it's Robbie's favorite game, too. Who knows? Are are you serious? This is the game I got to write. I got to go effort paper now. Yep. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Grab a notepad. Oh, Oh, no. You think I would? Oh, He's like David Spade. <laughs> Maze. It's amazing. Yeah, he takes off his headphones to walk over to his backpack. You knew the game. <laughs> yeah, this, it's in the intro. He knew. Uh, we're playing two for you, presented by Dingman's Collision Center. Dingman's, your one-stop shop for all your car needs. They are family-owned and family-run local business. Been in the business for over 25 years. They've been voted best of Omaha for nearly 20. Four locations throughout the metro area, along with the standalone mechanical shop. Uh, At 120th and Maple, they have a give-back program too, Robbie, which uh, allows you, if you take your car in, they'll service it. They'll give it back. But instead of you donating money, they will donate money to whichever jar you choose. Okay. which I think is pretty cool. So uh, Digman's puts it in the hand of you. They are uh, invested in the community and they are invested in you. Digman's.com. Let's play two for you. So 888-638-4876. If you want a chance at a Hale Varsity Club gift card, uh, we'll play the game regardless of a call. Ravi, have you played this game? I haven't. This is even better because Shane is... You have to write stuff down. Let's just say Shane is a gem. I have to write stuff down too? You do. Okay. Because you have to you have to keep your answers. Can I just type so here, it? Yes, you can type it. Okay. Here's how the game works. I will give four prompts. Okay. Okay. Let's just say a color in the rainbow, for example. Oh, yeah. You'd write down a color. Shane would write down a color. Okay. At the very end, we'll go back through the answers. I will give the prompt, count down from three, and on one, you say the answer. Okay. So I'll say three, two, one. You guys both answer. say answer. Got it. And if you get it right, good news. You move forward. And we're both trying, trying to get, to get two out question. of four. So I'm tr- trying to get the same answer that Shane's going to write That Shane's going to write down. Gonna write okay, down. I got he's it. trying to get the same answer you're going to write down. It's like the, it's like the Newlywood game. Similar. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Exactly. I watched a lot of TV <laughs> game shows when I was a kid. You watched a lot of Newlywed games? I did. It's fascinating. Yeah, that was good stuff. <laughs> game show network. Yeah, My mom seen, loves that. Have you ever seen the, uh, go a little off track here, Yeah. the blooper answer of, so I think the question, the prompt was something like, you know, what is like the, the most beautiful 
thing in this room or something like that. And he said wife number two. <laughs> <laughs> Some, something something crazy like that. Well, as somebody he, let's just say he got hit with the cardboard. As somebody on wife number two, I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> I meant more like on stage. Oh, the uh, life in number two. Sure, spot. sure. <laughs> All right, let's do this. You and Shane, okay. let's kick this thing off. I'm ready. You pick the one or two. One. Okay, here we go. Shane, ready? Yeah, I got my pin. Something you plug in. Okay. Name a face card. So a, a face card and a deck of cards. Okay. Okay. A common pet peeve when you're in a car. He's thinking hard over there. Yeah, I know. I'm waiting for him to say that, That's going to be tough. That one's tricky. Yeah, I don't think we're going to get that one. Yeah, I don't think so. Great confidence <laughs> out of this group. <laughs> And the last one, a food item that starts with the letter P. Okay. P as in pen, which you use to write stuff down, Shane. Like an ingredient or just any type of food? A food item that starts with the letter P. Any type of food, Shane. So any type of food as a whole? Yep. Just something like any, that starts with the letter P. Something that comes a in a pan? <laughs> Something are, are you, you saying Pam or Pan? Pam or Pan? <laughs> I think I can help solve this Pam Pam debacle. <laughs> All right, let's go through the answers. You ready? Let's do it. All right. Robbie, how you feeling? I feel great. I don't think you do. All right, here we go. Question or prompt number one. Something you plug in. Three, two, one. Phone. The right answer. Nice. Name a face card. Three, two, one. King. King. Boom! Woo! That one had me nervous. Not going to lie. I thought Shane was going to go Jack. <laughs> Love it. Good job, Shane. All right, two out of four. So you, We won already. You're productive in the game. We won already. This is where you try to go four for four. All because right. if a listener was on the phone, they could double down with these answers. Ooh. Go from 10 nah, to 20 to 40. On this one. A common pet peeve when you're in a car. Three, two, one. Singing. Uh, what did you say? Singing. No, you didn't. What'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> Show me your answers, Spanish. It's over here. You can't see it. <laughs> I can't see it. What, what was your answer? I was putting a, a pet peeve of mine as a, I was just saying, no, somebody that not turned their turn signals on. Okay. That's oh, a pet peeve. okay. That's I was thinking life. like in a road trip, like on a road trip, uh -huh. people in your car, not mm -hmm. other people. Yeah. I, I would have probably said traffic. Okay. Pet peeve when I'm in the car. So my head was in a different space. Yeah. I was like, I was thinking road trip, multiple people in your car. Uh, and then the, uh, la the last one, a food item that starts with the letter P. Three, two, one. Pizza. Pizza. Thank goodness. Let's go. Shane was going to say like paprika or something like Three that. Three out of four, Adam. Shane. Yeah, nice. Okay. Love nice it. work. Nice work. Love it. All right. So now you have a good, like, you know. Yeah. You have, I feel good. You your feet in the sand. Yeah. You're, you're good to go. Yeah, I feel now good. Now we run it back. Uh oh. Robbie, you want to play with me? All or right. you want to play with Shane? You get to choose now. Hmm. Because you could run it back with Shane and try to go four for four. I'm feeling good about the, the mental wavelength the Shane and I are on right now. So I'm let's cool. go with Shane. I'm cool yeah. with it. Everybody loves Shane. Yeah. No. <laughs> Come on, All right, Shane. Shane you got to write it down again. You no. got it. Okay. I believe in you. All right. Here's the last round. Two for you presented by Dingman's Collision Center. Okay. A state capital. Okay. A president. Within the years of 1950 and 1970. Okay. Something you laugh at. Okay. Okay. And a kicker in the NFL. Hmm. Hold on. I love the deep breath that Shane <laughs> the just exhaled. God, I can't think of a single one. I, <laughs> I can't either, so I think that counts as nice. getting it right. Nice. <laughs> Why Come am I on. blanking on every kicker's name? It's one <laughs> kicker. That's it. I want to say Janikowski, but he doesn't kick anymore. He doesn't. That is correct. He does not. Florida State, great. Janikowski. Great guy. 
another guy that doesn't take any more <laughs> Roberto Aguayo from Florida State. We can keep going through kickers that don't play, or we can do a kicker that actually plays. There are 30 of us. I think this guy still plays. This is going to be an awesome answer. Shane, what do you got down I don't, there? I don't have an answer? answer. You have to write something down, man. <laughs> Just write down a fake name. Maybe it's right. Okay. <laughs> So, All right. so we're not going to get four. <laughs> All right, here we go. This is this is amazing, guys. You guys don't realize how much I love kickers. I know. I hate you all. Right I now. totally just you said that. I was like, I can't think of a single active kicker. I I even had you look up kicking stats. I know, day. I know. But you were looking. I was looking at historical kicking stats. That's true. So all the names in my head are like Vinatieri, Vanderjack. <laughs> like I've got. <laughs> I went Morton Anderson for a second. Yeah, Morton <laughs> Anderson. <laughs> you guys are. Wow. And oh, then okay. I was like, wait a second, who is a single actor? You know, kicker? and now that I think about it, I said a kicker in the NFL. I didn't say like right now. I just assumed you meant active. Yeah. So okay, here we go. A state capital. Three, two, one. Lincoln. Lincoln. Boom. Okay, off to a good start. A president within the years of 1950 and 1970. Three, two, one. Jay Kennedy. Kennedy. Yep. Nice. Count it. Count it. Count it. That's who I would have said. Yeah. But I went to Kennedy for high school. Mm. So it made sense. It was on the brain. Something you laugh at. Three, two, one. Comedy. Jokes. I think that counts. I'm going to count it. I'm counting it. Shane hit the bell. He's counting it. No, Shane's a part of the game. <laughs> it's up to me. Count it. Hit the Comedy bell. Comedy and a joke. I said jokes in general. Okay. I'm counting it. Jokes are comedy. Yeah. And comedy is filled with jokes. It's a, uh, it's a stretch, but I'll give it to you because yes. it's the same premise. Yes. Okay. It's like JFK and Sting Kennedy. Same thing. No. <laughs> no. That's, no. Ding. Hit the bell. Completely Hit the bell. different. <laughs> All right. The last one and the most. I don't feel good here. I don't feel good here. A kicker in the NFL. Three, two, one. Carlson. Gould. Gould is a kicker. Yes. Is he still there? He is. He, I couldn't remember if he, he was the 49ers. Right. That's what I thought, but right. I couldn't remember if he retired or and not. Because Carlson he's, is a kicker, Shane. Is that Seahawks? I, I, is Dan, the Raiders. Who does Daniel Carlson it's kick? Raiders. For? Is that who he, Was he with the Seahawks, or am I just making that up? Yeah, Jason Myers is with the Seahawks, and Daniel Carlson is still with the Raiders. All right. Well, there you go. You guys both picked active kickers, so well done there. I think that's a win in and of itself, considering both of us were like, yeah, wait. Guess what? Chain, let me hear it. <laughs> let me hear it. I might have stalled the off, crank. Oh, that. yeah. Now we're not going off the rails and squealing tires. I get it. Okay. Three out of four. Nice work. I'm just saying six out of eight. That's pretty good. Yep. It six is. out of eight. It is. We're Even on the same page, Chain. Five out of eight. Well, I was generous. Well, <laughs> we're just talking to Louis Vicare next. Clear. Rogers and Benning will be back in four minutes. Rogers and Benning will be back in three minutes.
Rogers and Benning. We'll be back in two minutes. and Benning. We'll be back in one minute. Rogers and Betting will be back in 30 seconds. Varsity Radio with Andrew Rogers and Damon Benning. Hey, welcome back. We will continue our schedule breakdown of Nebraska's 2023 schedule with Louis Vicar in a few moments. Talk about Northwestern. All the new stuff that has come out about the program in the past few days, few hours even. And then we will get into what they'll actually look like on the field because even Matt Foster said something that was pretty shocking that he thinks they could be the team that falls off this year and um, people probably squint and tilt their head at that like can they can they get even worse uh, no, they, I think they, they could they be probably yeah. good but before we go anywhere uh, let me take a moment and talk about another one of our great sponsors Dyer Law if you have been hurt in a personal injury accident, you can count on the Dyer Law team to provide you with a helping hand when you need it, no matter what you're dealing with. Call the Dyer Law team at 402-393-7529 uh, or visit Dyer.Law to chat with trusted professionals about your personal injury claim. That's Dyer, D-Y-E-R, dot law. As we look at Northwestern, though, as a whole, here's like some basic some, some basic things. Mm -hmm. So since winning the Big Ten West in 2020, mm -hmm. they are 4-20 and 20 and have just two conference victories. Yeah. As we know, one was to Nebraska last year. Mm -hmm. Northwestern has three or fewer wins in three of its last four seasons. Yes. They're 1-8 and eight in Big Ten play in all three of those seasons. Not great. Not great at all. And it all seemed to go downhill after Mark Hankwitz retired. Yes. So Northwestern allowed 30 points or more 15 times over the last two years since Hankwitz was done and lost all 15. The five years from 2016 to 2020, only 14 times. Um, that's more years, Robbie. Yes. If you can count. Yeah, I'm not great with math, but I, that does add up. <laughs> now it's time for David Braun to come in and take over. He's from North Dakota State. Good defensive coordinator came in to run the defense, get them back to the prowess that Hankwitz had them at. But now he's in charge of the whole thing. Yeah. With everything going down with Northwestern. And uh, there's there's a lot to recover from. And it's not just the hazing allegations. Let's start with 
just this team. The football of it. Yeah, the, the, the product that you'll see on the field. Offensively, this team averaged 13 points a game last fall. Yes. 13.8 to be exact. That's very bad. They failed to score 10 points in six of their last eight games. Iowa thinks that's bad offense. Yeah. <laughs> um, can't believe their OC kept his job. Yeah. But who knows? Uh, well, so who, who'd want to take over? <laughs> and Fitzgerald came out and said before he got fired, obviously, the only reason he did keep his job is he didn't want to make changes on both sides of the ball mm -hmm. in the same year. Right. Like that's the only reason that guy has a job. This offense finished 128th nationally in scoring, 128th or 123rd in yards per play, and 130th in turnovers. That's quite bad. Last year, they were painfully inconsistent at the quarterback spot. Yeah. Now, some of that was because of injury, but they also had way too many turnovers to count. Mm -hmm. But now you get a guy by the name of Ben Bryant out of Cincinnati, a pretty good transfer, a proven guy. Phil Steele in the magazine, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago with Phil Steele, and this is something we've been referencing a lot mm -hmm. uh, throughout this process. He made the prediction that Ben Bryant's going to be the starter day one. Yeah, I think so. I think that's right. I, I know I know Brennan Sullivan's back. Ryan he's Holinsky's been, back. Yeah, he's he's Brennan Sullivan's been kind of fighting for the last couple of years to maybe get that job. Um, I think it's going to be Ben Bryant, though. I think that's correct. Cam Porter, can he recapture form after the ACL injury? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's taking over for Hole. Should be okay. I think offensively at the running back spot, that will be the team's strength early on in the season. That's a relative thing, though, right? right? Because it's the strength amongst a lot a of big bunch teams. of weaknesses, right? Right. So it's strong. It's probably the strong part for Northwestern. I don't know that compared to the rest of the big 10, it's mm -hmm. going to be particularly strong. That That's a great point. Good point to make just for this team. Though, yes. Offensively. Yeah. That's where they'll find their strength. I think so. Now their receiving course weird. Cam Johnson uh, comes over from Vanderbilt. He played there from 2019 to 2021. And then he also played a uh, um, stint at Arizona state, mm -hmm. but the majority was at Vanderbilt where he had 120 receptions. They have Bryce Kurtz and Jacob Gill. They're pegged for bigger roles. They got A.J. Henning from, from Michigan. Michigan. So they have bodies. It's just a matter of, how can are yeah. they going to be consistent enough? You really only have Johnson as anyone with any sort mm -hmm. of productive track record in college at in any school. Um, Henning is a speedster, just crazy, crazy fast, but hardly any production at all, right? So you look at him and you say, yeah, there's potential there. That's probably a guy it makes sense taking a shot on if you're Northwestern, but very little in the way of actual knowns in that room. And then on the offensive line, they lost, of course, Peter Skaronsky, mm -hmm. Um, and he was just an absolute terror. Yeah, I mean, well, 11th overall line, pick. And, and yeah. that's why, yeah. right? It's 100% why. Um, now, they lost their center and right tackle, too, so you would think, Gosh, this offensive line is going to be it's going to be pretty bad. But they do return their left guard and left tackle. And and, and you know, Caleb Tierman, he could be really good. He could be a Sunday guy. Yeah. He's somebody that I I think puts you in a spot where you're you say we're not totally screwed at this at this position group. Hopefully, yeah. Um you mentioned uh left guard Josh, I don't know how to say it, Preby. Uh, that's what I would guess. That that was that's how I've um, he potentially has some, he's an in, interior lineman, so he's probably not going to go super high, but he's got some pro mm -hmm. potential as well. Um, but yeah, there's not, there's not a ton of bright spots here and I still don't expect that to be a very good unit in general. <laughs> I mean, it might be one of their better units, but again, kind of like the running backs, we're talking about Northwestern, pretty bad overall. And before we get into the schedule, literal breakdown for Northwestern, mm -hmm. before we get into where they rank among big 10 teams, let's talk about the defense quickly. They returned okay. five starters. They were the worst run defense in the big 10 last year. They lost their star of the unit to the Colts in the draft. Mm -hmm. Now, on the defensive line, they do have Najee Story and Sean McLaughlin, who showed promising signs last year, but not enough to really get you excited about this year. McLaughlin, more of the veteran presence in that group. Mm -hmm. At linebacker, if we're going to pick strengths again, I think this is where they could find early strength. Bryce Gallagher and Xander Mueller are back, who I think, if, I'm, if I am correct stat-wise, they were one and two in tackles yep, last year they for were. this team. Yep. And the secondary replaced well. You know, the room only lost a couple 
but grabbed an experienced safety and Jeremiah Lewis in the transfer portal. Azima should be fully healthy. Yeah. Rod Hurd is a vet. So defensively, when you look at the whole thing, you're kind of like, okay, that's they could be I, okay. That's where I think Northwestern should be. They could be okay. Yeah. That is and I think that's a lot of credit to Braun. I, I agree. Now, just yesterday they lost Nigel Glover, who was mm -hmm. their best recruit from last year, a four-star linebacker who was probably gonna contribute, right? He was probably gonna play, probably not start because as you said. That linebacker unit returned all three starters um, and probably was the strength of their offense or their defense. But he was probably going to have a rotational role, probably contribute on special teams as well. He is gone. He is not going to be part of the program. So as we talked with Matt Foster, we're probably going to see some attrition over the next three weeks or so as that 30 day timetable starts to starts to clear out. But that's the first one. And it's a big one. Let's ask the expert now. Louis Vicker joins the show, publishing, publisher and managing editor of wildcatreport.com at wildcatreport on Twitter. We've talked to him a lot lately, and Louis, we appreciate your time once again. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me, guys. Hey, so before we get into the new – well, let's actually – let's get into this first, and then we'll get into – the team, the on-field product, because I kind of want to share duties here because we didn't really get to ask you a little bit about some of those things. I, let's start here. So Northwestern launching two reviews and two athletics. One will examine how uh, Northwestern detects threats to its athletes and implements accountability within the athletic department. The other will assess the culture of Northwestern athletics and its relationship to the academic mission. What do you think the main point of doing this is just to say you did it to ensure that accountability to give the public something after an investigation when people and the media found themselves searching for answers just where does the athletic department go from here well i think it's for all those things right i mean it's certainly a pr move definitely i, I don't think there's any questions about that northwestern has been getting dragged through the mud for the last couple weeks here um i think it's it you know it's to prevent things in the future i mean to me when something like of this nature happens like so so this one happens to be hazing scandal you know northwestern the, the school involved is going to be completely focused on that at least you know for the for the immediate future they are it, that is going to be the focus it's not going to happen i guarantee you that um you know, and they, so they put in the monitors in the locker room, the independent monitor that doesn't uh, report to the head coach. They, they're going to have this detecting threats. The uh, school, the, the players and the staff are going to go through training and all that kind of stuff. It, it's a major focus. Some of that is PR, but you know that this is, uh, this is going to be the total focus going forward of the athletic department to ensure that this doesn't happen again. So I think, you know, all those reasons you listed, it's all part of why they're doing it for mm -hmm. sure. Louis, between the, the football program, obviously everything they're going through, uh, the baseball program's going through it now as well. Obviously that's less of a spotlight just because of what sport it is and the time of year. Um, have we not talked about Derek Gregg enough and kind of, I mean, how is he still having a job, Enjoyed. I guess, is my question. How is he that's still there? Question. Yeah, I, that's an excellent question. We certainly have been talking about that a lot on my message boards, I can tell you that. And I've talked to mm -hmm. many, many parents, and they are furious. And a lot of it is directed at Dr. Gregg, who, you know, like looking at the baseball scandal, he's the guy that hired Foster as the coach. It was his first hire as a Northwestern Athletic Director, and he – from what I understand, coaches kind of gave him a list and he sort of went rogue and hired this guy when he was warned not to. You know, I think he, his Foster's reputation was well known in the baseball community mm. and, and Greg hired him anyway. And then you have on the football side, while he didn't hire Fitz or anything like that, um, this did happen under his watch. And then, as you know, he was overseas when it was all breaking and when they fired Fitzgerald, he talked to the team via Zoom call and didn't take any questions, and parents really were furious about that. That's one thing. You know, there's there's a lot of 
uh, parents and players that don't agree that Fitzgerald should be fired. Some do. There, there's, there's, you know, and how long? Maybe they should have given him a year if they would have came out and given him a harder punishment initially. Maybe he wouldn't have gotten fired. So there, there's all kinds of opinions about that. But it seems everybody's united that Northwestern administration really bungled this. They mishandled it from the outset. There's a lot of anger toward Greg and even President Michael Schill, who, you know, came out with this two week suspension and it looked to me like they were just going to try to sweep this under the rug in mid-July and then the next day the Daily Northwestern story broke and you know it just exploded in their faces and then you know two days later they fire them so Mm -hmm. it was the same set of you know the same information he looked at went from two weeks to termination in a matter of three days. Well, and, you know, you get that two-week window. If we look at two weeks after, like you were talking about, the story comes out, and we we had a conversation last week about, okay, there's one person that says, oh, you know, this stuff was happening, and you have players defending Coach Fitzgerald. Now, just yesterday, or, or two days ago, one of the two, we had more information come out on Northwestern. Now, now those eight names have come out and said, like, hey, we, we're taking this. We're taking this to court against Northwestern. Just – Overall, how do you think the athletic department recovers from something like this? Well, they got to do damage control first, and I think they're going to be paying a lot with these lawsuits. You know, there's also Fitz's lawsuit, right? So Mm -hmm. he's hiring, or I'm sorry, uh, suing the university uh, for breach of contract. And so, you know, initially they agreed to this two-week suspension, and then uh, he got fired three days later. They didn't you know, inform him about it or anything like that. So he's ticked off. You've got the um, players now are starting to sue the university and Fitz for the hazing that occurred. I just, uh, the Tribune came out yesterday. They had a, a player, a player came out and put his name to it. Lloyd Yates, a former quarterback within the program. Well, a quarterback and wide receiver. He moved wide receiver later, but he came out and, and, confirmed all of these allegations and now that they've got 12 players now that are suing the university. Mm. So, I mean, it's going to be a mess and it's going to get worse before it gets better. I, in my opinion, because they've got the the locker room. uh, I mean, you really think about these kids right now, now they got a, you know, they lost fits and they got players, former players suing coaches in the university and they got an interim coach. They don't know who, if he's going to stay on after the year, it is just a, it is a nightmare. I, I bet you they can't wait to just start playing football so that, uh, you know, and just end the talk a little bit. <laughs> well, I'm sure media days not going to be overly oh, right. fun yeah. for this football team next week. I mean, you, you're lo- you lost your top commit in 23. You lost your top commit in, well, at least in 24. He's looking around now. He's shopping his options. Um, I asked about recovery of the athletic department. What about just this football team and, and the state that they're currently in with their on-field product and now with all of the stuff going on behind the scenes? How does this football team recover? And when do you see when do you envision them finally like getting competitive again? Yeah, so well, get competitive again. You got to remember too, this is a team that went four and twenty over the last two years. They right. were one and eleven last year. Had eleven game losing streak. You know, it, it's if you kind of look at it from afar, here's Northwestern just devastated by the loss of a one and eleven head coach. It's, <laughs> it's almost kind of dumb. <laughs> you know, and I he was an icon and a legend and all that kind of stuff. But it's when you look at it that way, it is sort of humorous. But they they lost. Yeah, they they've lost four decommits in their 2024 class now they one we have uh had one transfer so far so we'll see what that happens i I think you know for timing it's really bad if you want to transfer right i mean the season's like six weeks away a little over six weeks away i don't know how many players are going to find landing spots Mm. um i think after the season is when you'll really see uh, some attrition, you'll see players leave the program once they figure out who their permanent coach is going to be and they make all those changes and, you know, whether there's going to be new systems, who the new coaches are, assistants and everything. So that's when I think you'll see um, maybe more at that time. But this is going to be, you know, like I said, they're, they're already in the gutter, you know, and they got a interim head coach who's in a tough spot, David Braun just got here six months ago Mm -hmm. you know he came from fcs north dakota state he's never been a head coach he's never been at the fbs level 
So he's got to be drinking from the fire hose right now, too. <laughs> it's a uh, it's a difficult time. I do think, you know, this may galvanize the locker room. You know, it's going to be us against them. Nobody believes in us. They have zero expectations. When you have one win, you know, the bar is pretty low. So I think that would help, help them a little bit mentally. But it's going to be it's going to be some tough sledding in the Big Ten, I think, this year. Louis, talking big picture and kind of long-term view here, Northwestern, obviously a very proud institution from an academic side of things. This is kind of a black eye for the entire university. How much do you think they might, I don't know if this is the right way to put it, but sacrifice winning in the football program to sort of save face or restore their reputation in the short term in rather than try and quick fix the athletic part of it. Does that, does that make sense? Um, a little bit. I mean, I, I don't know. That, that's one thing, but um, you know, I don't think that losing uh, would solve anything. You know, I, I think, you know, is there, will there be maybe a de-emphasis of athletics? You know, will they're going to implant a monitor in there and I'm sure they're going to crack down on things really hard, but, you know, Northwestern is still, you know, Pat Fitzgerald, you know, I know right now he's, uh, his entire legacy is stained by this and, and deservedly so he, he made a mistake here. And, you know, whether you believe Fitz knew or not, in my opinion, he, he's accountable for that program. He should have known. And that, and that that's, I, I don't think that that's disputable. Um, but they did a lot of things the right way. You know, Fitz did graduate darn near 100% of his players uh, for 17 years. They were always number one or number two in the APR, the academic measure by the NTAA. Um, they they had they emphasized things, the, the correct things. They did things the right way. Now, they, this was a blind spot. I think this he made a mistake by not, you know, policing this a little bit more. And I think that maybe his leaders too let him down on that. It didn't seem like anybody went to him, but the, the players I talked to all said, if someone came to fits with this, he would have solved the problem. He would have eliminated it. You know, they're, they're confident of that. And so I think that the leadership, the captains didn't bring this to his attention um, and say, Hey, this is wrong. This needs to be stopped. And I think, I believe he would have done that too. So if Pitts did do the right thing for a long time, and I think his, you know, the the priorities of the programs were in the right place, this was something that happened under his watch. It cost him his job, but it doesn't negate all the good things he did over his career. Louis, I want to change gears here quickly. This one, just the last one from me. I want to talk about this season. What actually we'll see on the field. You're welcome. The quarterback <laughs> situation, because uh, this this is an interesting one. Last year, you know, a lot of inconsistency. The turnovers were a problem. Injury issues uh, appeared, but you add Ben Bryant. Northwestern adds Ben Bryant from Cincinnati. Um, does that just add competition to the room, or do you believe we'll see him suit up first in Week One? I think he's the heavy favorite. Yeah, I, I, they will have a quarterback battle, I think, this fall. But I think Ben Bryant is probably going to be the guy that emerges as the starter. He's the guy that has, you know, two years as a starter on his belt, both at Eastern Michigan and Cincinnati. He's, he, this will be a sixth year of football. He's a veteran college football player. And that's the number, you know, you brought it up. The number one issue they had last year was turnovers. You know, they, they turned it over 31 times during the year. They were dead last, 131st in the country in turnover margin. You know, I think if they just take care of the football, they'll win a few more games. You know, they, they really threw away a lot of ball games last year. And they did add some some speed, too. They, they got A.J. Henning, who had some big play potential from Michigan uh, in special teams and as receivers. And they, you know, they did some things through the portal, to, uh, especially a defensive tackle to add some depth there. Um, so, but I think, yeah, that quarterback position, I think it's going to be Ben Bryan. And if, if he just takes care of the ball and, is, you know, provides that steady leadership, a lot like Peyton Ramsey did as a grad transfer back in 2020 when they won the West, yeah, I think that they will be a much more efficient team and they're going to win a few more ball games than they did last year. Louis, about a minute left here with you. In terms of expectations, you said just by cleaning some things up, you think they can win a few more games. What would be an optimistic view of what this season 
just from a win loss standpoint could be for Northwestern. Yeah, I think you know the, their schedule sets up pretty well. They open with Rutgers. They they, they have two very winnable non conference games with UTEP and Howard. Howard's a little bit later in the year. Mm -hmm. And you know if they can steal one more win maybe two at the most, you know, they could be a, a four win team or something like that. I think, you know, yeah, for the most optimistic, I think if they made a bowl game or something like that, you know, I think David Braun could be the big 10 coach of the year. <laughs> right. yeah, I mean, really <laughs> pretty, astounding, <laughs> really. but I think if they win it just, you know, three, four games or something like that, I think would be considered a success for this season. Now, Louie, the over under is set at three and a half, or would you take the over or the under? <laughs> Um, three and a half, I would probably go under. All right, you're with the uh, consensus. Minus 160 uh, for under three and a half. Louis Vicare, we appreciate your time this morning. Thanks so much, and uh, we'll talk again soon. All right, thanks, guys. Appreciate you having me. Thank you. That is the publisher and managing editor of WildcatReport.com. By the way, the care. I would be surprised if they brought any players next week. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Ooh. Something and to even, think about. I, I'm serious. I would be shocked if they had players. Something to think about. That is interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Mm -mm. We'll take a break. We'll give our open picks, and we'll finish up North, what, Northwestern thoughts next. Rogers and Benning will be back in five minutes. and Benning will be back in four minutes. and Benning will be back in three minutes. and Benning will be back in two minutes.
Susan Benning. We'll be back in one minute. and betting will be back in 30 seconds. Coffee and Cream with Rogers and Benning on Hale Varsity Radio. All right, welcome back. Before we give our picks for the Open Championship, which we do for the major golf events, let's just one final time go back on our Northwestern conversation of the upcoming season because something Louis Bacare said at the very end of that was interesting to me because the over-under was set at three and a half, and he – alluded to the fact that I could see him getting to four. He's like, I probably would rest at three, but I could see him getting to four. And Robbie and I looked at each other like, "Eh, I don't think so. No, no. (laughs) I I don't see them winning more than two games this year. If that I don't, they may not win a game this year. Yeah. It's, it's pretty tough sledding for them. Um, Honestly, the the one game that I think... Yeah, go through the schedule here. The one game that I think they could actually win is when they play Howard... Which is like week five. ...on October 7th. Um, yeah, so that's one, two, three, four. It's week six. But So they start at Rutgers. Listen, that's probably their most winnable Big Ten game. I wouldn't count on it, yeah, right? Especially that's, with Greg Schiano at the end. Yeah, like they're going to be... Rutgers is going to be well-coached and... and don't forget, Rutgers at four and eight won four times as many games as Northwestern did last year. Uh, then you've got UTEP, who is pretty functional under returns Dana Dimmel. Their returns their quarterback. Um, you had said fifteen starters. Yeah, fifteen starters coming back. That feels like a loss and they were to a five me. Five and seven win. Yeah, they weren't terrible. They they weren't terrible. Um, they were seven and six the year before that. Pretty functional mm-hmm. under Dana Dimmel. Uh, then. At Duke, no. that's a loss. Minnesota, loss. that's a loss. Penn State, loss. that's a loss. Even though they only lost by, what, 10 points last year to Penn State? <laughs> right, yeah. Um, Howard's the one where you look at and say maybe they could win it. But honestly, they'd probably be better off if Howard came earlier in the season. Because if you start the season 0-5, you probably have guys right. packing it in by that yeah, point, Howard right? Howard could be 2-3 and three at that point. Right, and and you could have guys, after, you no, know, you start off poorly, Guys could be checking out. They could mm-hmm. be choosing, hey, I'm going to redshirt so I can go transfer. For the sake of this, let's say they win that game. So that's one. So they're one in five. At the um, at one in ne- six, excuse me. At Nebraska has to seven. be a loss. Maryland's going to be a loss. Sh- uh, Iowa in Chicago is going to be a loss. At Wisconsin is a loss. Purdue's a loss. At Illinois is a loss. Mm-hmm. I cannot see more than three. If they steal a Big Ten game. It's probably at Rutgers right out of the gate. Or it's against Purdue at home. Yes. Like but those are, those are the only two not, that I could roughly They're not getting see. both. No. They're not getting both. I can't imagine under a Matt Rule coach team, Nebraska losing at home to Northwestern. Well, I they won't on site. Don't see it. At, listen, I said last year, despite how bad I thought Northwestern was going to be, I was like, Pat Fitzgerald is a better coach than Scott Frost. Mm-hmm. I don't. I didn't feel good about them winning that game, right? Despite the talent gap and everything there. So, I. I but I don't see a way because Nebraska would have to beat themselves, and I don't think that's something we're going to see from Matt Rule teams. Um, I could be wrong. We don't know yet. We haven't seen anything. But I'm not giving. I'm not giving Northwestern a chance in any game. Honestly, I don't even think Purdue is a realistic option. I think mm-hmm. it's just. No, I don't either. Rutgers. Maybe UTEP because it's early. Maybe they're not, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. Sure. 
and then Howard. Those are the only three I can even sort of see winning. So the fact that the over under is set at three and a half. I am hammering that under, which is minus 160 currently on DraftKings. Um, and if you want to do a, degen- a degenerate bet with me, I'm going to throw in the Rams <laughs> under six and a half because I've been wanting to, but I didn't want to play an under. But if I'm going to do an under in Northwestern, I might as well do, Let's an do under a parlay bet, and we're going to do a parlay. I'm going to I'm going to look at some of the other college football over unders. I mean, just look at this, though. This this parlay of Rams under six and a half and Northwestern is plus two oh three. That's solid. That's good value. Yeah, for absolutely. Those two picks. Especially considering how much of a lock it seems like the Northwestern mm-hmm. one is. And the Rams are minus 115. They're minus 105 to hit the over. Do yeah. you dream about betting? Do I dream? No. <laughs> no, I I dream like Because typically tigers. you dream about like things you'd like to do or whatever. But I mean, because betting seems to be just in your nature, in your blood. It's just mm-hmm. like, I mean. I'm like Michael Jordan, man. I'm competitive. <laughs> That's all it is. It's not an addiction. It's not an addiction. He's just competitive. <laughs> All right, let's do the let's stay with betting and do these picks, Shane. So, as you know, we take two favorites and a long shot. Okay. So, Ravi, I'll inform you of this. So, the two favorites have to be above. Well, they don't have to be. Like you could take two long shots if you want. I would, I would tell you to vote against that mm-hmm. option. Sure. Because we'll take the cumul cumulative score sure. of the golfers in the very end if they miss the cut. On Saturday, they're they're out. You take the cut score on Saturday and Sunday sure. to add to your player score. Yep, and then that affects your total in the, in the end of at the end of it all. Okay. What I do here is I go online and I do sure you list do. randomizer. Mm-hmm. List. And I'm going to type in our names. Randomizer, got it. I'll type in yours first. Yep. Shane, Shane's always last. Shane second because Putting Shane he's, in. He's um. Let's just say hot and bothered. I was going to say the other one, but I don't. I think I got sure. you know, yelled at for that one last time, and I'll put me third. And then all I do is hit go here, and boom, there's the roster. All right. We've got Andrew. Jane, guess what? I'm first. Andrew's yeah, went first. Last. You should have went last. You're second. <laughs> I'm third. Let's do it. I'm always. Are we doing snake? And it is a snake draft. Perfect. So I love going back third. Back. I love going third. Snake uh, draft. Always got to be in the middle. Uh, yeah, always well, got to be the you're, Oriole. You're always the one complaining. Uh, <laughs> all right, all right. Let's do these picks. So uh, to kick things off, I know it's going to come as a shock to everybody. I will take the best player in the world from an analytical perspective. That is Scotty Scheffler, Andrew's first pick in the Open Championship draft. Oh, I, I forgot to talk about the stakes. The stakes: if you win, mm-hmm. the other two have to buy you breakfast. Okay, so and I'm already even on Shane after he blew us out in the Masters. Garbage. So do I get? Two different breakfasts, or you guys just split the Two cost of one breakfast? Breakfast. Okay. Yep. Deal. I'm That's in. That's how it works. I love it. All right. So I took Scotty Scheffler. Shane, are you taking your boy? I'm taking my guy. <laughs> John Rom for Shane. John C D Rom. <laughs> Listen, I'll just I'll just sit down here gratefully as Rory McElroy falls in my lap. That is true. I'll take it. Okay. So you're taking He's the Rory. betting favorite. I'll take him. Right. You're taking Rory. And uh you get Another pick here, Robbie. Yeah, I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go with Brooks Kepka as mm. my my second. Mm-hmm. As my second. I always like Brooks. I do too. Good competitive player. Yeah, but although he's pretty mad at uh, what's his name for leaving his live team, is that Fitzpatrick? Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How about you play? <laughs> All right, Shane. I'm gonna go with the uh, Victor. Uh, he had a top five finish last year in this event. Hovland. Yep. You son of a nutcracker. Are you kidding? No. Is that your guy? Oh my. Yeah, I thought I could steal him. You thought wrong. Unbelievable. I gotta reassess. <laughs> but you only got two minutes here. Yeah, I we know, got you're going. <laughs> well, no, normally you get a uh, what's it? You get two minutes on the fantasy football. Yeah, you're on the clock. Too. Um, Unbelievable. He takes Hovland from underneath me. Your guy. I'll trade you Hovland for Scotty. <laughs> I'll punch you in the face. Hey, no workplace violence here, guys. <laughs> I'll send a hippo your way. <laughs> What's our cut line? What? Oh, What's for, our... for the uh, for the uh, long shot? Yep, 3,000. 3, no, it's 4,000. Oh, it's 4,000? Plus 4,000. You told me 3,000. Did I? Yeah, you did. Ruins uh... everything. I'm just kidding. Okay, it's fine. I mean, if if we want to make fine. it three, if I if I if I said three, I'll, I'll own. My guy's above four anyway, so it doesn't matter. Okay, well then we'll keep it with four. Right. Oh, so uh, we're going three. Four. We're going four. I want to go three. Well, you took Victor Hovland from me, so we're doing four. 
Um, I will take <laughs> Patrick Cantley. I'm not happy about it, but I'll take Cantley. I think he could bust out this week. Not happy about that. Nope. And then my long shot above four, give me Max Homa. Market is totally undervaluing. Chilling with my Homa. And um, he's just got a lot of upside. He's got – he has – there, so the market is against him because he's had long term long term struggles in mm -hmm. major events, and he's just been playing really well. Five cuts in his last seven um, give gives good potential for a higher ceiling. Give me Homa, Chano. I don't know now. I good. Mean, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> you can go before me if you want to, Robbie. What? <laughs> yeah, let me just Baltimore Ravens this pick. I'm serious. You can. <laughs> you can do it. Go ahead, then I'll pick one. All right. I don't have a good reason for this. Um, and I'll tell you my reasoning. I like an actor of this same name, so I'm going to go with Adam Scott. All right. Good long shot pick. My Parks and Rec guy, Adam Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be confused with Michael Scott. <laughs> Different guy. Different guy. Different guy. Great guy. Though. Terrific manager. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like Michael Scott sometimes where I start a sentence and I just try to figure it out along the way. <laughs> I think that's a lot of sports talk radio is... <laughs> Just starting a sentence and figuring out where you're going on the way. <laughs> All right, Shane, and your pick is what as we wind down these final 30 seconds before we talk to uh, Ryan Ballingy? I don't know. Gosh. Um, you got this. I'll just, did, I'll just go with Bryson. Did you say Bryson already? No, Bryson is available. The Shambo is available. God. <laughs> what a bunch of garbage. You hate it? You hate the pick? Don't I feel do good about it. it. Listen. Hey, if, you, if I gave you 3000 who would you have taken? Uh, can I take 3000 Go for it. All right, okay. we'll, we'll let you take it. If you take Morikawa, though, I'm not letting nope, you Nope, I want it. Jordan. Spieth, yeah. Okay. That's what I was going to take if it was 3000 But then I was like, Adam Scott, my guy, okay. Ben Wyatt. So, Scheffler, Cantley, Homa for me. Shane as Rom, Hovland, DeChambeau, or Spieth. Uh, because he foregoed his pick and we're giving him speed. <laughs> and then Rory Brooks and Adam Scott. Love Robbie. it. Those are the picks. I love my draft. Be open. Here I go. I'm going to start parlaying the three now. <laughs> to the border I go. But first, we're talking to Ryan Ballingy. He's next. Clear. Rogers and Benning will be back in four minutes. Rogers and Benning will be back in three minutes. and Benning will be back in two minutes.
Rogers and Benning. We'll be back in one minute. Rogers and Betting will be back in 30 seconds. Coffee and Cream with Rogers and Benning on Hale Varsity Radio. Welcome back, Coffee and Cream in the morning on Hale Varsity Radio, powered by Currency. Robbie Lula, Andrew Rogers. Hold it. Back with you. <laughs> Live from the H&H Chevrolet stage at Hale Varsity Club. Happy to wind this thing down with Ryan Ballingy. Talking a little golf. The Open Championship. He's the owner of Golf News Net at Ryan Ballingy on Twitter. B-A-L-L-E-N-G-E-E. Ryan, good morning. Hey, thanks for having me on. Hey, thanks for joining us again. We just went through our plays. I'm going to read you off the three for each, and you let me know who you feel most confident in as if you took a cumulative score of these three golfers for the event. Okay. Okay. All right. So my picks were Scotty Scheffler, Patrick Cantley, and Max Homa as my long shot. Shane took John Rahm, Victor Hovland, and Jordan Spieth as his long shot. (laughs) And that's, of course, him making that ding. And Ravi took Rory, Brooks, and Adam Scott as his long shot. Who do you feel most comfortable with? Whose grouping is going to take home breakfast this time around? That's a good well, Oh, man, that's a tough one. Um, Scheffler's so good. Can't yeah, he is. Surprise, but Homa has no top tens in a major. Rom and Hovland, I love this week. Speed's creativity is excellent. He's been under flying under the radar a lot of the year. But then you got Rory and Brooks. Man, those are two great. Oh, gosh, that's hard. <laughs> um, that's really hard. Maybe think, may, maybe even just base it off of who you think is going to win. Who, who was Rob's third guy again? He had Adam Scott. All right, I'm going to go with Rob. Oh, Robbie, Boom! taking it home. Nailed it. Nice work. Okay, okay. <laughs> now, now let's get back to business, Ryan, since you didn't pick me. Um, <laughs> So the Royal Liverpool has out of bounds everywhere. Let's talk a little bit about course condition here and um, things that could get in the way. How cautious do you expect players to be off the tee, especially if winds start to pick up? Yeah, that's going to be the story, right? I mean, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we're supposed to get some pretty decent wind and a little bit lay down on Sunday, but you're going to have a consistent 10 to 15. But those guys don't worry about 10 to 15 mile per hour winds. They're worried about gusts of 20, 25, 30 miles per hour if they kick up. And if that happens, you're going to play a whole lot more cautiously. You're going to play away from internal out-of-bounds. You're going to play away from hazard-type stuff. I mean, the thing to avoid here more than anything else prevalent on pretty much every hole is bunkers. Bunkers will kill you on this golf course. Mm -hmm. That is the one defense other than internal out-of-bounds. But I think Scotty Scheffler put it really well leading into this tournament said, you know, the, the way the Tiger played this place in 2006 where he hit driver just one time, you can't do that now because the game has changed. The equipment's better. And there's somebody in this field that's going to be able to confidently hit driver all over the place. And so you've got to be able to put the, the driver in play. So, yeah, they, they might try to play away from hazards. They might try to play away from OB. But ultimately, these guys are going to have to find a way to put driver in play. So that's the challenge this week. I think that it's a little bit different from the maybe the other times we've seen Royal Liverpool in the last you know 20 years. Ryan, when you think about all those things, you just mentioned the course conditions, the bunkers, the out of bounds, how, or or I guess who in this field do you look at as perhaps uniquely qualified or able to navigate those things maybe better than some of their peers? 
I mean, I think it starts with great driving of the golf ball. I think that's going to be very strongly rewarded mm-hmm. this week. And so you think about the three best players in the world, right? I mean, at least on the as far as the official world golf ranking goes, you think about Rory McIlroy who's driving the ball great. Scotty Scheffler drives the ball great. John Rahm drives the ball great. I mean, there's a reason they're the three best players in the world. Mm-hmm. They get the ball out and play, and they kind of avoid a lot of the muck. And they don't need driver. I think Min Woo Lee is a really interesting longer shot play because mm. he's even more powerful than those guys. So if there's anyone who's willing to attempt the Tiger strategy to avoid bunkers, it could be Min Woo Lee. Not, not to say he's going to, but he's a very aggressive player. But he could if he felt the need. It could be really interesting. Brooks Kepka drives the ball extremely well. I mean, he, he gets the ball in play where it needs to be, makes him particularly dangerous. I think the best players in the world right now are, are really typically the best drivers of the golf ball who then can make something of the opportunities they create because of how far they hit the ball. So I, I think good drivers are going to be rewarded this week. That's not to say you, you can't have someone like Brian Harmon, who's not as long hitter as those guys, not even close, and can't be successful. I just think you're going to have a whole lot easier time in any condition if you can put the ball out there confidently. Ryan, if you're mapping out who you like this week, who, if you were a betting man, you'd like to bet on, are you primarily looking for accuracy off the tee, solid mid-iron game, or someone who is locked in in their short game? It seems like there's a general understanding that, as you said, the fairways and greens will be missed. So I'm curious who you trust to recover from errant shots that will succeed this week? I think that's a good question. I think the equation is a little bit different in the open than it is the other majors, right? Because the majors we play in this country, the rough is deep. When you draw a bad lie, the chance of you being able to run something up just to kind of salvage a green, salvage a hole, make a par and move on. They're not very high, but the open, the rough may be, may look tall on TV, but it's wispy. It's not very thick. More often than not, you can at least put a club on the ball and advance toward the green. And yeah, even though it's going to be fairly wet, I still think the ball is going to bounce out pretty far. So you're going to be able to run balls up to green. So I don't think guys that are necessarily inaccurate off the tee are in deep trouble here, especially if the wind comes into play. Wind's going to get everybody. And the more, the stronger that you are, the, the less clubs you're going to have because you're just going to hit it farther off the tee. I think that's an advantage. But almost every week, the, uh, on the PGA Tour, the emphasis has to be on how good of an approach player you are. I, I don't care whether you put the ball in play far off the tee. You've got to be able to hit your irons well. If, if you can hit good approaches, you set up birdie and eagle opportunities. So that's why I think about someone like Victor Hovland or Colin Morikawa or Tommy Fleetwood, guys that are, are flush in the ball, but they may not necessarily be the longest off the tee. It, it, so long as they avoid kind of those hazards because the bunkers are like half stroke hazards. As long as you can avoid those, you've got a pretty good chance. And I think you've got to accept that despite your ability, the weather or a bad bounce or something's going to put you in one of those bunkers sometime. No one's going to do what Tiger did and avoid all of them like he did in 2006. So you're going to have to accept that at some point and take your medicine. Ryan, a long shot at uh, 30 to one Patrick can't lay According to CBS Sports, they kind of like, uh, according to one of their uh, predictive models, they like his chances. He's finished in the top 15 in his last five majors. What are your thoughts on a guy like Cantlay and his ability to maybe make a run this weekend? I would kind of lump Cantlay and Shoffley together, not only because they play together in the Zurich Classic, but they are kind of the same guy competitively in that they're extremely talented players, right? I mean, they're, they're both great tee to green players not the great putters but both great tee to green <laughs> players and p- bad putting doesn't really mean a bad thing this week i, I think floor greens generally are accepted as better for bad players speed matters more than line so that that's helpful but for me for both of those guys until you prove to me that you can win one i can't put money down that you're going to win one i don't care how many top 15s you have mm-hmm. a lot of can't lay top 15s and 10s in majors are frankly at, from when he was long gone having a chance of winning. So that's cool that you finished well and you played better than most of your peers for four rounds. But if you didn't have to deal with the exact same pressure of trying to win, mm. I'm, I'm not particularly interested in betting you, on you to win. I might be really interested in betting on t- Patrick Cantlay on a top 10 or a top five bet. I think he can get there, but I just don't think he's a threat to win. Now, recent history tells us, Ryan, 
to bet those at the top, to bet the favorites, to not shy away from them in this tournament. Um, and, and that dates back even five years. I think there was only one name that entered the mix of the top five that shouldn't have been there at the beginning of the week. Who's your pick to take the whole thing? I mean, the non-Scotty and Rory division, <laughs> I think the most interesting pick is Dustin Johnson mm. because he is criminally undervalued in the betting market. He's something like 30 or 35 to 1, depending on where you go. He was tied for 10th in the in the U.S. Open, playing pretty well on Live. I don't know what Live means or how it translates to major championship golf, but he's still playing really, really good golf. And I think people sleep on him because he played poorly in the first two majors this year. I think he found a little something. He's contended in this championship a bunch over the years, still puts the ball out there pretty far. I, I think he's probably my best value play, but it's hard to look past the big three. I mean, they, they just are so good. All they've got to do is be able to putt marginally better than they've been doing week to week, and they win this thing. So I, I think you're you're probably secure in the top three on the on the board, but I really think Dustin Johnson's underrated this week. Ryan, just about a minute left here with you. Uh, kind of an odd question, but I'm curious, what do you think, considering course conditions and things we were talking about earlier, when we're sitting here on Sunday, what do you think is a, a reasonable winning score for this thing? I usually think about an open as minus 16 wins unless there's some kind of weather intervention, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a venue that gives up low scores as it is. The question mark is really just the wind blow. If the wind blows, you probably get closer to 14, 13 under par. If the wind doesn't blow, I think 20 to 22 under par to win. I think people can take advantage of it that big. So pretty wide swath of scores, but I think setting it probably an over under or 16, 17 under is probably fair. Ryan, we appreciate your time this morning. Thanks so much, and enjoy the Open Championship. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. That is Ryan Ballingy, and uh, he is the owner of Golf News Net. That'll do it for us today on the show. We'll be back tomorrow. Thank goodness we made our picks, boys, because uh, they tee off at 12.35 a.m. tomorrow morning. <laughs> so uh, it's a good thing we did it today and not tomorrow. So if you are interested in watching the Open that early, you sure can, or you can watch it like us at 5 a.m. That'll do it. We'll see you tomorrow.